Recording is on. Well, good morning, everybody. It's um, it's morning for me, and it's January the 30th. Uh, and this is the Eastern Extinction Party meeting. I will have the Western one later today. Um, and so this is the early one, and uh, it's quite a full agenda. Um, I put down the questions on Reddit for that people have asked, and they kind of crammed into this. But does anybody have any Thing they want to ask or anything first before we get into the questions that people asked who weren't here? Well, yeah. I, I, I could answer the first uh, the first number on the list. Oh, well, I could answer partly uh, the DGR interview because I, I'm getting, I just got a message from, from Sue that she's still waiting for Max to get back uh, to her about uh, is it okay to upload uh, her interview. So I I can just say that I'm waiting. That's all. Okay, good. Yeah, I hope um, I hope they will let, let us just publish it. It's like, come on. <laughs> um, I've got two questions, or maybe it's a double barrel question, following on from the UFO thing. Um, um, yeah, I guess. I don't know which one to ask first. Um, you know, you've heard the accounts of the the uh, the first ships from the from the old world visiting the new world, and the you know the accounts of the native people not being able to perceive the presence of the ships, even though they'd be bluntly obvious. And I, I was reminded of that recently, um, reading an account that it also happened here in Australia with the uh, early British. Um, ships that arrived here and uh, one of the ship's log entries recounted how they were very close to the shore and uh, they could see the native people going about their business, hunter-gathering or whatever the hell they were doing uh, and they, apparently they were quite close by, uh, you know and, and the people on the ship could see the people on the shore very distinctly and see what they were doing and yet the people on the shore were obviously totally oblivious to, to the presence of the ships, that just absolutely no indication whatsoever that they could see these things sitting out there. Um, so the, 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 that's the first question is relating to the ufology thing is, are there going to be some people, you know, and you, we could have a little extinction arty wank here and say, you know, people like us who are, who are a little bit to one side of things, you know, so one of these bright, shiny, magnificent flying saucers is going to land one day with the beautiful luminescent blue light radiating from underneath it and the, and the lovely little coloured portholes and the smooth ramp coming down through the thing. And we're not going to see a fucking thing and everybody else is going, look, 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 there it is. Can't you see it? It's right in front of you. Do you think that is a scenario? Oh, yes. Yeah, so um, the, the ship is a good example, but it goes both ways. So you can see... You can be a native on the shore and not be able to see the ship, but you can also see stuff that isn't really there by the same token, right? It goes goes both ways. Because uh, And generally where I'm going with this is that you must always think of it as something inside going out. So, you know, if Cook lands on the, the shore, uh, you know, everybody thinks of this event of Cook landing on the shore, but it's it's like... You must think of it more from the point of view um, of the natives is they they have no conception uh, or way to relate to a ship. So it just doesn't feature in their cognizance. It's just not uh, something that they can, you know, assume that there, there's no prior knowledge or consumption that lets them uh, perceive it. So it's, it becomes uh, just unobservable. Um, and so you can see things like Everett talks about the Piraha, and the, and he uh, he tells the story about how they they see this apparition, 
um, across the river that they can see this, you know, paranormal entity, and he can't see it. And they, they they amazed that he can't see it. They can all see it, and they're all looking at it. And he's like, mm, "There's nothing there." But um, so, uh, but you see, unpack it slowly. Like every every one of those Pirahana villages, they knew what the entity is. They know what its name is. They they know all about it. It's part of their tradition and folklore. Um, and I think the fact that it's on the opposite side of a river is is important. Um, so imagine it's on the same side of the river, let's say. Uh, then imagine this more like an acid trip. If you've ever had an acid trip, you can see like, you know, a root in the path or something becomes a snake. And, you know, you can see things going a little bit weird. Now, uh, you know, our rationalist reductionist thing would say, no, it's always a root. You, you know, it's a root in the path. You just saw a snake and you imagined it. And it's like, uh, not so much. Um, you know, who's to say? <laughs> it's like the, the observer counts. And if there's no other observer, it's the tree in the forest falling and stuff. It's like, yeah, cool. You know, if you see a snake and you're the only one that's observing, it's, it, it's, a, it's a snake. And so the, imagine that this guy is on the same side as the river as the Piraha. Now, they could easily walk up to it and go, oh, no, okay, just an illusion. It's a, it's a tree stump. Look here, everybody, and wrap it. You know, they say, now, why do we prefer the, the answer that it's a tree stump than, rather than it's some paranormal Sasquatch or something? And it's, it's just because of our bias to, to normalcy. Right? There's, there's no, you know, you could just as well make the argument if they walk up to the tree stump on the same side of the river and, uh, and wrap it, they say, no, it's, it's, a, it's a Sasquatch. The Sasquatch just, you know, sat there and they, they wrapped it on the head going like, oh, it's just a tree stump. You know, if they, if they were all Michael Shermer's, they, they would turn it into a tree stump in their LSD trip, which I'm calling reality and LSD trip here. They would walk over and make it into a tree stump. Why? Because that's their preferred bias of, of normalcy and least alarm and it's kind of the least energy. So I just in, ter in terms of interpreting all these things, I think that there's some guidelines to give people to, you know, so that they can kind of see the truth of, of these things. And so one of them is um, that I've seen a lot of weird shit. I mean, weird, weird, weird shit. And uh, you can ask me all about it. And I, I don't mind saying these days, because especially because the last one, I got a better reception out of the stuff I said than, than I expected. And uh, I think I uncorked a, a, a lot of suppressed um, questions and stuff that people have. So I think these Michael Shermer's and these, our, you know, enlightenment humanist ideal, the progressive ideal, has corked up a lot of stuff in people so that you can almost hear the frustration. And it's, it's becoming acceptable these days to kind of explore that and take the, the rigid rationalists uh, and normalcy bias, um, take that cover off it and start to really, you know, open open minds a little bit. Um, I, I just saw something with the, I was kind of appalled, but this, uh, it's that uh, physicist guy, what is um, James Al-Khalili or whatever his name is, the English guy, English Iranian or something, and he was talking to some other kind of Graham Green kind of guy and, and, and they were saying, you know, talking about aliens in space, and they say, okay, well, yeah, obviously not ufology, because, you know, those guys are just so dense, it's such easy targets, and they're, they're all laughing and stuff. And that, that just pure arrogance, that conceit of them, you know, uh, that's so common on the left now, I think it's starting to aggravate people. And they, they start, you know, it's just so smug and so closed minded and so intolerant. And it, it's like, People have had enough of this, and they're saying, like, dudes, we've seen stuff, okay? We've seen way more than you can explain in your humdrum explanations. So they, they have this tyranny of this progressivism where they're saying, like, well, we, you know, they're aliens. We absolutely believe they're aliens. And if you say no, you know, like I always tell them, no, there are no aliens out there, then they jump down my throat. So, so that's part of their religion, that there is life out there, even though all the evidence stacks up saying there isn't. 
they, they part of their religion is well there must be life out there because sagan and you know digressed out, but you have to have it on their terms you know it, is it coming down here and doing anal probes and you know cattle music oh definitely not why oh because you know the high priest said so it was like but there is stuff out there absolutely so they got it completely inverted and they monopolize this conversation and it's really tyrannous it's just it's like the the catholic church and they have an inquisition of what's allowable in woo and stuff like that and so it's like and so i think people so i'm getting way more comfortable with talking about this because this uh, and, and telling you the way to look at it. Okay, so I started off, just to recap, that I thought I had to tell you about this because things are about to get pretty weird. And I think that was the first question on the list was Tom's one is, why why are they starting to reveal all of this? And then it's like, well, uh, it's what I was trying to say to you last Sunday. It's like, I think this thing seem to be coming to a head. See, everybody can see that something big is coming. And it's... You know, it's it's epochal. It's like the transformation of humanity. And everybody can see it, you know, to Klaus Schwab, it's the Great Reset and the communist utopia and then to the anarchists, so it's the end of authoritarianism. And, you know, the um, to the Christians, it's the rapture coming and to the, you know, Islam, it's all the end days and the final hour. And to the technocrats and stuff, it's the rapture of the nerds and it's the technological singularity. But over and over, everybody can feel we're converging on this kind of critical point, like a phase change in, in humanity. And it's so, the Kali Yuga. <laughs> yeah, it's the, end of, it's the end of an age. So we went through a trial run of 2012 where it was the end of the Mayan calendar. But it, it's this millenarianism, not millenarianism, millennialism. Basically, when... This happened at AD 1000, and everybody thought, well, when the clock ticks over to 1000 years, that's the, you know, that's the second coming. And stuff. So uh, it's, we, we're getting to that kind of point, just like 2012 and stuff. And so you can see there's a big change because everybody, everybody knows we can't carry on on this path, on the same trajectory much longer. It's, you can see it's all coming to a head. Um, and so everybody interprets it differently. So, so the reason why I'm going to this trouble to try and tell you about this and tell you about the flipping and stuff. So for, for us, it's the flipping. It's, it's as big as the world turning over. And it is the world turning over as far as I can tell. Um, but uh, you see, it's important if you're going to survive it. All I'm trying to do is get you to survive it. But it's important to survive it, to know what's going on and be able to navigate these very turbulent waters. I said in like the, I don't know, the third video of mine or something about, about transformation and about this kind of personal transformation. I said, you know, the, the, the trajectory going in determines the trajectory coming out. So you want to go in as kind of like neutral as possible. Because if, if you have, you know, if you go into this, again, like the, the natives on the shore interpreting Cook, so Cook's ship arrives, they, they're going to interpret it in, in the, the metaphors they have, all the, you know, the archetypes, the, all the Jungian archetypes, all these elements of perception, they're going to come together to try and incorporate this new information that, you know, that there are strange beings from the other side of the world on a ship that doesn't look like a ship because, you know, a ship is a canoe to them. And this is definitely not a canoe. It's kind of like almost like an island, except it's not quite an island. It's floating and, and nothing makes sense. So they just eliminate all the information and eventually pick out the bits that they can see. And there's like, you know, well, the guys look kind of pale, but they're humanoid. And, yet, you know, you can see the thought process that goes into interpreting an event, which is just completely out, outside their ken. And so that's what I was going to ask: is what it, what it, what is the, um, the 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 initial? You know, how do you get to the initial ability to see something that previously couldn't be seen? You know, if you get the, 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 what's the primal experience? By correct interpretation. See, what I'm trying to mm. give you here is. Is I'm going. To, I'm in effect. I'm a, I'm a sage in effect that's saying, look, there's something about to arrive, and you know I know what it is. It's cook on a ship. But you you're gonna yeah. you know you're the natives, and I'm trying to tell you in like impossible native speak what's about to happen. Yeah. Now, the it's very important that you 
you know, the trajectory you're coming into this encounter with Cook is you interpret it correctly because you see everybody's got a different idea of of what it is, and that's going to determine you know the outcome, the trajectory coming out of this big event, and whether they survive it or not. So, for example, if you know the reason why I get so hot under the collar by people like Kings North and that is they they <coughs> setting up um, a Christian rapture. So when you know this is Armageddon, this is like the field of Armageddon and the apocalypse and everybody's coming together, all the lines of thought and all the lines of discovery and all the philosophies, they're all coming down to this one field like Kurukshetra or Armageddon, where you know the force it's 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 the same thing as Tolkien. You know, you're all this thing where the ox and all these things come to the final battle and that's what we're doing. It's basically we're brewing this this thing up. Now if now, everybody comes to the battle with a different conception. If you come to this with a Christian conception, you're going to, it's going to influence what you see and what comes out at the other end. Now, if you say, oh, this is the second coming of Jesus, and now we go up to heaven and stuff, it's like the chances of you making it through are zero because you just won't get the right cues. <laughs> you know, you see, it, it becomes pretty much like uh, Monty Python and the life of Brian and you know so basically everybody said oh this is the time when we kick in and do the suicide thing and they were like oh like and I was like oh like boom and then said ah that showed them and it's like yeah that, that's your fate so in a way you're choosing your fate now so if you come into this saying I'm a Christian and then you're choosing your fate you it will be some flavor of outcome of going up to heaven which is by the way death see I'm telling you telling you how to avoid death most of these trajectories coming in means that you're not eligible. I mean, think of it like sperm or something going up a birth canal towards the ovum. You know, there are millions and there's this great migration. Imagine the mind of a sperm. is like only one is going to get through. But all the other ones, you know, some of them are blocking sperm and some of them are, you know, navigating sperm and some of them are leaders. And, you know, it's, it's all like a, a, it's a, a kind of super organism, you know. In this one ejaculation of sperm is a super organism. They all got different thoughts. They almost different, got different casts. They just discovered this recently, by, by the way. And the, so, but there's only one that's going to get through. Well, all the others have their destiny. Most of them to die or become hormones that influence the rest of the birth process. But everybody's got a role to play in this huge thing, like what Jung would call it, the hieros gamos, or the, you know, it's a, the final wedding of opposites. You know. Stuff like and so, so yeah. Everybody has a role to play. So I'm, I'm telling you, as you know, survivors <laughs> that, that make it through this process is is basically how to interpret it all, so that you know you, you so that you don't become a soldier ant and your destiny is to die as a bit part on, on you know on the stage. So. Um, so, but to do that, you have to understand the play, and you have to see because everybody just winds up in a part. You know, think of it in a Shakespearean terms. That everybody, all the world's a stage, and all the people merely players. Well, everybody, you know, picks a part and think, well, well, I'll, I'll have this part. You know, I'll be, I'll be Harry Potter, and I'll be Voldemort. Now, the great thing about it is you can, you're free to choose your part in this play. <laughs> that's, that's how it's a very involuted play. So, but the people will. Most people, the vast majority, will choose a part that doesn't survive the final curtain, right? So, you know, just just by the proclivities in nature, they're not destined to make it through this. <laughs> and to, so, to, to, is to, uh, sorry, to, to clarify, basically, when you've started on the path of UFO, um, because I, I'm sorry, I missed the last meeting, but um, I, I did listen very, very carefully to, to the last Easter meeting, but... Um, you are kind of engaging on the same route that you've done with Christianity and transhumanism. Basically, we're exploring parts in the play and we're we're going down the avenue of ufology at the moment with in relation to to a belief and to a but uh, my question is like there's a lot of these people who are who are into ufology who are Christians um in America. So how do they reconcile this kind of thing? I mean it's just you know, I know we talk oh. about parts. I, 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 I know what we're talking about. I know I understand very well where you, where you're going, trying to, 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 to help us to get a good 
interpretation of what's going on. But I'm kind of looking at the being a bit the devil's advocate there, because there's a lot of people who are who did you hear online and talk about these horrible things. I, I really hate UFOs. I just it's just it's something I, I I don't like to go near. And when I see I've met some people like that, and a lot of them are very Christian. Yeah, um, so, yeah, I'm glad you asked this. I also hate UFOs on the basis of I hate Harry Potter, the subject, because their interpretation is it's Harry Potter. And I want to, in this meeting, I want to try and convince you that Harry Potter is not right, and it's not the right way to look at this. And I'm saying this from somebody that's seen all this weird shit. And so uh, the Christians, I mean, okay, Mormons are not Christians by any stretch of the imagination, even though that most people in America don't understand that. Um, but the Mormons are quite okay with this uf ufology, and they've, you know, infiltrated everything, and they're in the nuclear bunkers, and they're looking forward to the rapture. And so you see how dangerous this is, because everybody interprets it differently. When when the world goes crazy, and the world is about to go crazy, I mean, well, you can see it already, the, you know, everybody is going to say that, okay, this is said in my book, that bloody, all the books, by the way, are all tricks. They're all tricks to make sure you don't make it through, you know, the flipping. And so, except for mine. <laughs> And even then, you've got to interpret it. Right, right. So, so the books are not, uh, you see, to do a good deception, um, and all the books are deception, right? They're your alien cortex. You see, the, alien, the let's just take this as red. The alien cortex doesn't make it through the flipping. So it's it's trying to screw you up. So it's not, it's not passive here. It's not like, um, you have to imagine when Cook Cook's ship arrives, uh, the natives on the shore, you actually have some, you know, double agent or, you know, out there doing a PSYOP and telling them all sorts of stuff that will make sure that they don't survive cook and then they get overrun. You see, in a normal battle situation or something, cook would have, you know, put a few um, guys ashore to, you know, do a PSYOP on the guys, prepare them so that when he arrived, you know, they, they would say... They would have been told in advance that a great God is going to come and you must lie down. You must, the first thing you must do is get rid of all your weapons and, and then cook around. They're like, ah, we did a good job here. They're all worshiping me and they haven't got any weapons. So, like, take their stuff, let's go. <laughs> you know? So, you have to think that the, the hostile intent and the hostile intent comes from your alien cortex. Your alien cortex kind of has a premonition that this is not going to go well for it. And so it's doing everything it can to screw you up. And it's been doing that, you know, for a long time, 10,000 years or so. So if it writes a book like the Bible that's designed to screw you up so that you don't make it through, it, it's basically, it can't write a book that's just slate, straight out deception because it will get, you know, it will, um, uh, you, you'll see through it, right? And, you, and reject it. So it's, it's got to be a very close miss. And the way to do it is make it Delphic. So the, it's the old thing with the, the Delphic prophecy that gets you it, it, in Macbeth, you know, they win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. So the Bible's got honest trifles. It just betrays you in this deepest confidence known to man. And it's saying like, oh, you know, Jesus already died for your sins. It's like, no, he didn't. So basically, that's the deep consequence of saying, like, there's a God outside. You're not God. There's, you know, God's a weird thing that doesn't really work. Imaginary person in the sky. And, you know, it doesn't really work. His sun comes down and you know, it doesn't really work. But anyway, you know, we hope you forgive us all those details, Kings North. And then you, but just, just swallow the main thing that you don't have to die. You don't have to go through anything because Christ did it for you. And if you get swallowed by that, you, you know, you, you're going to not, you're going to sit there in front of the steamroller going, I'm a Christian. No, this all works out well. I'm uh, looking my book and you're going to get squished the, in, in any way. I mean, I'm using a metaphor to replace literally drinking Kool-Aid in Ghana or something like that. Is that. Those guys are going for that kind of solution because they won't understand what's happening to them. So, so, and also again, you know, the, this is not passive. There also will be, you see, in Ghana, there were there were people that went around with AK-47s and made the people have the Kool-Aid. So, you know, you, it's not only, oh, you know, um, yeah, I'll sniff it first and then, you know, decide if it's Kool-Aid, I won't have it. It's like, 
yeah, that's your alien cortex, and it's um, it's illusion of control talking. So you know, you're thinking, well, I'm in control. I I I can leave the Christian church whenever I want. I, you know, I can dabble in this cult or that cult, or I can dabble in progressivism. But if it doesn't turn out, I'm clever. I'll see in advance. I would never have gone to Ghana. Yeah, you would go to Ghana. You're already in Ghana. If you're progressive that believes in this techno futurist world, you're deep in Ghana. You you years, if not months away from having the Kool Aid. And so when the Kool-Aid time comes, they're going to put an AK-47 at your head, right? That's, you know, it's serious stuff here. And it's not all up to you just because you're a liberal and you've just had a long run of um, being, you know, self-obsessed and you have this illusion of your self-importance. And so, so like, you much rather get the idea that, like, to make it through here, you've got to be like an ant. You've got to be like a clever little rat. Is that it's like you know, you know forget the illusion of you know all of these things have to go. Um, so this is like going through the eye of a needle, and it, it basically your ego has to go. So your that's your alien cortex, and so you know, it, but everybody's ego is telling themselves you know like oh I Hugh doesn't know diddly squat like you know like um, Hugh is. Uh, not as clever as he thinks he is. And, you know, my, uh, he was putting up a straw man. My belief in the Bible is a lot more sophisticated than that. And you say, yeah, 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 you're dead. Because you, he's not listening to what I'm saying. He's basically going for this trajectory that is not liable to see you get through this, kind of think of it as a singularity or a point of transformation. So, okay. Can we just, um, yeah. uh, something you said there is taking me back to, to something we haven't really got back to, which is this sort of cult that you're forming, be that tongue-in-cheek or not, um, because what you were just saying there a minute ago about, you know, oh, you know, it's okay, I, I'm not, I could leave this cult or I could leave that system, belief system and all the rest of it. Um, but I will be, uh, probably not now, but I, I, just to bookmark it, I think we probably should have a conversation at some stage amongst the people who are associated with you about the effect that this little group has had so far uh, in terms of thinking, oh, it's just a casual thing. And, you know, I, I, I could just stop listening to Lord Hugh anytime I want to. Uh, and, um, you know, this is this hasn't really turned out to be a cult after all. Um uh, this is where I'm hoping that Lionel's paying attention to what's going on. Um, it, because, I mean, just to, to, just my own personal experience is, is like I really didn't want to come to this meeting this week. I just wanted to be left alone. Um, but I, And I've noticed I've been in that, felt like that sev several times. But there always seems to be something that Lord Hughes dangled out there uh, that has come up that kind of makes it really not the right time to not come to the meeting. I, you know, really, this week, I, 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 just one more time then, just one more time, and then next week. But you realise that, you, you you know, in a way, you, you, you're you caught in a, a, a similar sort of situation, um, maybe at a, 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 you know, not such a serious level, I don't know, uh, but anyway, I just thought I'd insert that little point just just there. Well, you know. Yeah, think of it like this. So cult cult literally means and then we get words like culture and cultivate and all of these agriculture and all of these things. They the, it's an Aryan word and it's an Aryan concept that was very native to the Aryans because they invented the wheel. So it actually means the boss. The boss, or the, the root word boss and all of these things, it, it, it means the hub of a wheel. The way to think about it is just, um, you know, a large gravitational mass. So you go into work every day. The reason why they don't want you to work from home now and stuff and that's because they need you to go into the, to be in orbit around the boss. That's, you know, it's, it's stupid not to work from home in this day and age, but they, they can't articulate it but they can feel that the whole of society is falling apart. And the reason is most people, they go into work and the work is a cult and it's in orbit around the boss. I mean, everybody in Amazon is in orbit around Jeff Bezos, right? And same with the muskrats and stuff. It's basically, so you think of me like that. It's like I, I'm, I'm a, um, 
an orbital mass, right? So it's a, like a planetary mass. And then everybody that gets into my orbit is like satellites around me. And that's literally what cult means. It means the hub. You think of it in like water swirling down a drain. So it's like I'm, I'm like a sinkhole, like in, you know, those Einsteinian things that show you curved gravity when you go to the science museum as a kid. And they have these big conical holes and you roll the ball and it goes down the hole. I'm one of those holes. Now, whether I'm just in a depression or a deep hole or something, you know, in other words, how much gravitational mass does Hugh have? It's, it's not really up to me. It's just up to the kind of forces of the universe that are like the forces of truth or something like that. It's, it's, it's basically you have a sense of, okay, I would like to introduce this concept of we don't we've got we've had ourselves completely screwed up in terms of energy and information and entropy and all the physics of the enlightenment era has completely screwed up our understanding now i would <laughs> i would like to correct it all also from the from the point of view of seeing you in the right tra, you know trajectory going into this but you see if uh if you imagine yourselves kind of in in orbit around my gravitational mass then uh, you can see a few things like you one of the things to get out of your mind is this liberal conceit that you're somehow autonomous you're not influenced by anybody you're just uh, you know you are you like you just never in orbit around everybody you you are a creature of your own destiny and somehow you can just navigate through the solar system without touching anybody else's gravity or otherwise anybody's gravity that you choose all of this is illusion illusory you you have about as much control over this as you know an orbiting rock or asteroid or comet it basically it, you're gonna fall into some some planetary body's orbit so that the first thing is you have to be subject to somebody's gravity. So it's just a question of what, it, you know, it's like, do you listen to Hugh or do you listen to Elon Musk or something like that? It's basically, you, you don't have, so the, the thing that everybody assumes is not, a, is not a choice that's available. You have to be in orbit around somebody's gravity. There are exceptions to it, but you know, only if you have the knowledge can you actually use those exceptions for another for example they're lagrange points and all stuff like that but you know here i don't think most people know what a lagrange point is and you know to, to use a lagrange point as a metaphor is um is is difficult enough as it is and because you know it's like people don't even know what a real lagrange point is with gravity and so but um do, do you know what a lagrange point is no, what, what can you explain that? I don't know what it is. So, uh, Lagrange point is simply put where all gravitational masses cancel out. So it's a it's a point between all the gravitational masses where they all have equal influence, and therefore you if you so the James Webb Telescope has been put in a Lagrange point. So the the Earth as it goes around the Sun has like th four Lagrange points, no more actually. The the uh, but they, they're very defined points where you're kind of being sucked equally in, in all directions. So you just stay in this point of neutrality. Now, uh, the Grange point is, is not an absolute microgravity because there again, you, if you say, you know, the James Webb telescope is parked in a, a L1, I think is a Grange point, something like that. So if you're in L1, it, it means that you're in the Lagrange point between the 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 sun and the earth but i think the the moon will come around and screw you up so you've got to keep on changing the lagrange point to stay in orbit <clears throat> in, in neutral orbit around the moon and then the same with all the other planets they have a weak influence but some and so you say like what's the ultimate lagrange point and eventually you, you have to take in into account the whole galaxy and neighboring galaxies the effects you know get smaller and smaller as you go but they're still there and so what I, I'm trying to communicate to you here is, you know, you don't have an option of not to be in a cult. Everything is in a cult. So, so, uh, so that's that's the first thing. And it's like, well, how much uh, power do I have over people and people on this call and stuff? It's it's only as much as my gravity. So, if if I'm talking nonsense or contradicting myself or something like that. 
um, it, it means that I'm kind of cross-polarized and all the power that I have will disappear. If, if the, I make arguments and stuff and I seem to make sense and everybody you know, seems to be logically consistent, that's kind of like, imagine now, okay, switching metaphors to electromagnetism. So if, if all my parts are polarized north-south, then, then that's a powerful magnet. Because most people, um, they kind of, uh, like, like an Isaac spin model, you imagine, the, go and have a look at an Isaac spin model. Was made. All their kind of magnetic parts are all unaligned. I've, I've said to you how many times before how people hold, hold these two thoughts in their head that, and, you know, I said going to the Christians in India, then that experience I had going and meeting those Christians. And there they're saying, you know, the one moment, more, more likely the, the right hemisphere, is saying that, you know, because they're Christian, they can see, look at the world. This is 2007, right? 2007, 2008. So it was when the economy, you know, there was the crash on Wall Street and there was a little bit Armageddon-y. And then and, and 2012, uh, Mayan calendar fever was just coming out. And they, so they were absolutely convinced. All the signs are there that, like, we're in the final days, you know, five years max, and it's the rapture. You know, all the signs are showing the rapture. This is the right hemisphere talking. Then you, the subject moves on to India and India's future and economy and stuff. And then, and then, then they were like, oh, well, you see, look, look at India's trajectory, straight line. And then you're talking straight line stuff. Yes, you know, they're in the left hemisphere. And they're like, by 2050, India's going to beat America. India's going to be the most powerful superpower in the world. Because look at the people. Look at our trajectory. Look at the linear, linear, linear and stuff. So, and so I said to them, like, don't you think the rapture is going to screw that up a bit? And they were absolutely polaxed because they, they, I'd connected these two, uh, these two dis, uh, discon congregu discongruities in their head that, that you know, they, they never had seen these two thoughts, never entered the same room at the same time. And, and they were stunned because they suddenly realized their whole world was. You know, imagine, put yourself in their sandals as they suddenly saw this thing that they'd never known, that they have absolute conviction in their right hemisphere that we're in the end of days. And then absolute conviction in their left hemisphere that no, by 2050, you know, India will have superseded uh, America as the premier world superpower. <laughs> and, so, and so it's like, okay, which is it? And, and so, you see, most people have these, uh, these uh, cognitive dissonances, and that makes them weak individuals. So, you know, a lot of the, when you have a discussion with them, you can tell it's like this idea conflicts with this idea and conflicts with this idea. But if you actually quite aligned and you've like, say, like, you know, everything I say is consistent, you can see that, well, well, Hugh's got his, his ducks in a row as a way of talking about it or everything aligned. Now, that, that makes it a a powerful source of attraction. So now you have to be careful because once you meet an individual that has their thinking pretty pretty well aligned, then um, you have to be careful in which direction it is <laughs> aligned in because uh, you know everybody knows that a complete nutcase is dangerously consistent. You know, a psychopath, dangerously consistent in their thinking. Um, uh, so that if you get a you know, a monomaniac, or, you know, they, then they can attract quite a big cult following. Um, and the reason is because they're coherent. They have a coherent, to a point, um, they have a coherent story. And then, you know, people with a cognitive dissonance, say, oh, that makes so much sense. Um, they have a, a visual feeling of, of these, these blockages being ironed out. So the way these incongruities and kind of mental inconsistencies and all this it's it, most people's head is a complete mess it's very much like donald duck in math magic land if you see if you've seen that that's a beauty right there and they're like donald duck and they, they have us like donald we're going to teach you about mathematics but first we have to go into your head and clean it out and then you see this magic broom go into this office and it says you know superstitions and quaint ideas and inconsistencies and beliefs and the, and then the, the broom goes magically sweeping all of this stuff up now this, people's minds are literally like that is is so when you actually have a conversation, you sit down with a beer with them or something like that, all you're getting is like 
all this cross talk of nonsense. And so, um, so w that uh, cross talk and where these kind of domains, if you think of them as Ising spin models, where the domains actually connect and st uh, um, you have these domain boundaries. Now those domain boundaries, that's what, what Freud would call an, a neuroses. So a neuroses is, is just, you know, a conflict in thought. Mm -hmm. So for, for example, I'll give you an e easy example. There's like, um, say Jung, Jung had an affair with one of his patients, uh, Sabine Spielrein, I think. But she, um, her, you know, they, they spent hours and hours getting to her problem of her neurosis. And her, her neurosis was basically she was very repressed in a very repressive kind of Prussian environment. And um, the whole issue was with her father. And her father was a strict disciplinarian because, you know, he was pretty Prussian. And um, so he used to spank her and beat her and stuff. And but she got turned on. She got sexually turned on. So the she the society is absolute taboo to get turned on by your dad. But she couldn't she couldn't help that. It was a most stimulus she got in a day. So so the fact that her, her authoritarian father was you know making her reptilian brain have erotic thoughts and stuff. Was, was completely in conflict with what society told her that she must be a good Freulein and be repressed and stuff. And so, you know, what, what Jung's doing in her psychotherapy is just finding a story that, that allows her to accept the, you know, the, the taboo in, in so the society imposed on her. What, in other words, what he's doing is just getting all of these conflicting thoughts, emotions, ideas, is just getting them to align somehow. So there are various ways of doing it. But you see, when, once you do that, uh, it's saying like, okay, now, you, now you're good to go. You're a good, healthy person. They say, no, not really. When, if you as an individual get all your ducks in a row, so you get all the bits and pieces polarized in the same direction, all it means is then you go out into the world and then you have to basically get into orbit into this bigger domain of the society. So you have to. So if you, so if if uh, Spielrein gets her act together, gets cured, in other words, doesn't all it means is she has to go out into the German society and then try and work on the German society's bigger conflicts with the fact that authoritarianism is closely related to eroticism. And so, you know, the society has a big disjunct. So you just get into a bigger and bigger domain. Now, what all these idealists and communists and stuff think um, is they're thinking, yeah, but on the left, you know, again, particularly from the, the right brain, from the mammalian brain, they say like, well, obviously the world will be healthy and good and fantastic when everyone's aligned. And you say, yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah. but, but um, you know, they, they don't want to put in the hard work of, of getting alignment. It's a lot of work to get alignment. So, so, so what, you know, I put things out in videos and stuff and immediately, you get, well, in some quarters, you get a really, really hostile reaction, mainly people that have a strong ego there. So if I say something about Darwin and somebody's a biologist, they'll do their nut because they've, They've invested, like, you know, years and years and years in college and thought and everything to get to the Darwinian prejudice. And then Hugh comes along and completely blows it out the water. And they're like, it, it's very challenging now because they like, what Hugh says makes sense. They suddenly see what Darwin said was a whole lot of horseshit. And so it's like, but how can I invest, how can I invest 12 years, 20 years in horseshit? And then, you know, to hear that's wrong, how do I incorporate you? So then they basically, they will try, most people will try and get this new information and shoehorn it into their existing information with as little, with as little loss as possible. So they're trying to do the least action. So in other words, going back to the guys on the shore, when Cook arrives, they will try and shoehorn this new and completely intolerable worldview, A, that there's a whole other culture, a world outside this, you know, Australia that they, you know, they thought everybody was black. Everybody was, you know, everybody was 
had a certain kind of uh, outlook on life and so and suddenly they've they confronted with this intolerable thing that they're not, not even close to right. <laughs> There's some weird crap out there. And clearly in one ship, you can see it's it's you can see it's a little fragment of an incredible civilization. I mean, just look at the cannons and look at the, the sails, and you, you know, anybody can see that like this is a, a one, this this is not the whole world, this is not Europe that's landed, but it's a, a little chip of something vast. You can just see it in the technology and stuff. So how do the Indians or the Aborigines or whatever on the beach incorporate all of this? Well, they try and do it in, in what's the least trouble possible. And they say, well, okay, we, let's go for this little theory. We, you know, Let's dredge our, our legends and our myths and say, do we have anything like this in our myths? Uh, yeah, okay, it doesn't really fit, but we've got this legend that gets a couple or whatever it comes down and transforms us. So Okay, okay, let's stick with that one. Okay, that that's that doesn't require us to adjust very much. So let's go with that. Least action. Then I think that actually happened in South America, didn't it? But it doesn't work. And at some stage, their whole freaking house of cards falls down, and they say, "Look, this oh. is doesn't work. This guy's not Quetzalcoatl. He's killing us all." <laughs> and there's like, okay, there's the flipping. Right. But you see. It's going to take people down. A lot, a lot of people, you see, if you've spent a long time just getting a zeitgeist together, and so you've just you spent a lot of time putting the puzzle pieces together, trying to figure out how life works, it's, it's, a, it's a daily process for a lifetime. And then you're completely confronted with the fact that, like, all your puzzle is bullshit. It's just crap from start yeah. to finish. For most people, they would rather die than start building their puzzle from, from scratch. There's a, so, um, I, in that situation, I, um, I've noticed that sometimes, and I've often uh, thought of the words in that song, uh, MacArthur's Park, where there's a line that goes uh, about the cake, you know, that it took so long to bake it and I'll, I'll, I'll never have the recipe again. And, like, he's just this... I can't build it up again. Like, you know, it, it's been shattered and I can't do it again. This is all just... Uh, but, but you see, this is what happened. This is, how, this is how the story of humanity advances. I mean, it's like who said, Linus Pauling or somebody said that, that science advances one funeral at a, a time. And so it's like, no, I, I mean, I wouldn't even bother to try and put my, my theory about Darwinism out there. I mean, I just put it out there on, on videos and stuff. But cautiously, because I, I don't want to spend the rest of my life arguing with somebody because it's just doing psychotherapy for them. And most people, especially if they later in their careers, like somebody like Dickie Dawkins, you could never convince him of like the fractal theory, even though he could see it was right. He just couldn't admit it to himself. He would rather get old and die saying that it's bullshit. And so that's why science advances one one funeral at a time, because nobody really changes their mind, especially if they've been heavily vested in, in the old paradigm. And so, you know, that. so right there, I mean, literally die, not just intellectually die or something. It's, it is, it, you know, Dickie Dawkins built his whole life on neo-Darwinism. So if you come late in the day and prove to him that it's absolutely wrong, all he's going to do is he's going to say, the world's gone mad. The kids today, they're full of these stupid ideas and they've completely lost track of the golden light of St. Chuck and the Darwinian masterpiece. And the, the, they, they've lost contact with, with you know, the, the, uh, you know the, the eagle and the, how's it, the falcon is losing contact with an ever-widening gyre. And he's saying this, this whole society is going to crap. Everybody's heads is full with woo. Um, it, it's, uh, the whole society is a write-off. Now, that thought is, has implications to you. I mean, you, you're sending out pheromonal signals to your, to your body, saying stuff like, um, you know, it's time to die. And uh, you, you start processes of apoptosis. The guys can visibly age and they will be out of the paradigm. It's like the, and it's, this is, this is part of the way the world works as, as things you know, move on. Um, yeah. That, it reminded me of, uh, I think it was the, uh, 
not last week's meeting because you were talking about the microwave glass oven, but I think at some earlier time when you mentioned that, I think it was one of the fellows who was involved with that where he said to you, you turned his view completely upside down. Um, and uh, But the interesting difference there was that he appeared to be, even though it was quite late in life, he appeared to be able to accommodate your radical upsetting of his life's work. So, you know, there's obviously people who can who can do what Dawkins probably can't do, you know. And, well, it was different in that case. So, so okay, he was in his 80s and he was very open-minded. So he still had plasticity of mind, which not a lot of people did. But I didn't, I didn't uh, change, I didn't flip his worldview or anything. I, um, I opened up a new vista in, in things where he already had a problem. You see, what normally happens to academics and stuff, they go uh, and build this body of knowledge and insight and then they have to be careful to maintain their standing and stuff is not to be too heterodox to still pay respect to all the gods you know like like darwin and stuff all these people that have statues they can't do too much statue toppling but in their old age they get to realize that all their icons and einstein and all these things that they're talking horseshit but they you see like kaufman's in this position it's like you can see he always pretends that Darwinism is correct and Darwinism. He never lets comes out in public, which you know you can obviously see. But he's just paying lip service to the old gods, because otherwise, you know, because he knows if 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 the headline came out like Stuart Kaufman says Darwin is horseshit, it's like he he wouldn't be given the podium ever again. So they have to be careful what they say, but they they give signals. To the new generation to say psst, psst, Darwin's horseshit, and but anyway, you know, and then they carry on, uh, and then you know the new generation is malleable plastic, and they can they can pick up on on these these new ideas. But you see, yeah, it looks like he's again, leaking information. It looks like he's giving little snippets of information yeah. and leaking. But yeah. you know, it, that's what it, they do. You see, it is kind of you, it, it could be intentional too. I think. Oh no, it's very intentional. You yeah. see, it's kind of like Sidney Brenner, and uh, who's the Lovelock and what, what, what was the woman's name? Calusa uh, or yeah, Calusa, whatever. But Calusa and Lovelock and all of these guys—they were saying absolute, absolute heresies and heterodoxies, but they couldn't completely, you know, give the game away. They had to just hint. But you see, where these guys get to is they they get to the point where. They can see they're on the on the tip of something new. So they, they're at the edge of the heterodoxy. They're right on the perimeter. I think that's why Lee Smolin and those guys called it the Perimeter Institute, because they're saying, like, they, we we just on the on the right side of acceptability, but we can see this vista opening up. You can see the new world, the new territory opening up in front of us. And although we're too old. To into the promised land, we can actually see it, and we and so that's where uh, Dr. John and stuff was. Is like he knew the limits of all the ideas that that they'd had from per, from the invention of the magnetron, from Randall and Boot and stuff. They knew that their conception of electromagnetism and stuff. They knew it was at its limit and not quite right. So you get two schools. One one of these guys are the closed-minded kind of a little bit thick guys and they they think um okay we're about to close the book on it you know i'm getting to the end of my career we've, we've kind of got this all locked down and we're about to close the book it's the end of history it's the end of uh, electromagnetism now from here on out there are no new discoveries we'll just teach uh, kids physics as history and you know, and my name is right there. I've carved my little niche, and there, there, I, I, there's my contribution. So I'll live forever because from here on out, and the you know, people will just learn, uh, you know, how this stuff was discovered. But uh, there are no new discoveries in electromagnetism, absolutely certain. So you get, I'd say, then probably the majority, a few guys who actually uh, can maintain some youthful plasticity of their brain and thinking, some open mindedness all the way to the end of their careers. They get to the end of the careers and say, you know what? I made a monumental mistake. This whole edifice is bullshit. And then, then 
they sit and think and when they retire, often when they retire, they'll write one book or something that gets ignored. But in that book, it will be like a parting shot to say, you know, just blow, blow the edifice apart. And then they die. And so, so, but anyway, this, this process is extremely slow, <laughs> but it, it is the process of, of that, that everybody has to go through now, because if we, we're coming to the end game, right? So I, 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 I think most people think, well, science goes on, you know, again, like these Christians in India. Yeah, they think, most people think Ray Kurzweil style. So you can see this in people like, um, yeah, you can get these Neil deGrasse Tyson types or whatever. And, you know, on the one hand, they can have the conversation, Duma conversation. And you, you can see this discordance in, in like, you know, Roger Hallam and all these, these uh, leaders, even Bill McKibben, all these guys. They, you can have the Duma conversation, Michael E. Mann, um, the Hanson, all of them know that we're absolutely screwed. You can have that conversation. But then you... You still get into the thing, but there's loads we can do and stuff. No, but you, we just we just established there's nothing we can do, and then they but they can't get this other piece to say you know. Then you can have a I'm sure you can have a conversation with with Hansen saying you know. But in the decades to come, won't you know? Won't genetic engineering blah blah blah? And he'll have that conversation. He won't say what like Hugh will say to you is like, no, we're getting to the end of science. He's saying like. How much more so have we got to run on science? Ten years? The James Webb telescope is it. They say, oh, but one day we'll discover, we'll put the pieces together, we'll find out if there's life and everything. Say, in the next ten years? No, not in the next ten years. So I say, like, you know, so then never. And they're like, well, I wouldn't say never. And they say, but you just said we're all heading for doomerism. So it's like, you, you can be pretty sure they're not going to build, they're not going to spend 20 billion now doing the next bigger Large Hadron Collider. But how many people have got been okay with saying, well, you know, the LHC was the last big experiment in science? It's like none of them are there, even though they have know that we're all fucked. So it's like you can see all the disconnects and stuff. So now why I'm bothering to tell you all of this stuff and – putting you in orbit around my cult is is to uh is to say that when all this alignment happens it's going to happen astonishingly rapidly with astonishingly great effect so you know when and 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 how it pans out is is um it, it's not going to be a smooth ride right this is going to be the most turbulent thing human history human human psychology human physiology just the philosophy everything is going to be put under stress and tremendous turbulence. And, and so if you're going to be a rider on this storm and make it through to the other side, you know, you, you're going to have to, you know, we to a, a good analogy is we, we're heading for these rapids. And so we, we're at the point of you know, no return. So the point of no return, if you're heading towards the rapids, where we're at now as a metaphor is saying you're Pocahontas, you're in a canoe, and you, you know there's something big coming up because you can hear the rumble of the falls. You can hear the <laughs> that looks like something's coming because the river's getting a little bit faster. You can see the current going like that. And so you're saying like, and there's a lot of rumbling coming out. The scenery's changing a bit. You know, you're, you're like, um... I think we might be heading for something big up ahead. You know, well, it's actually the Niagara Falls, but okay. But in this analogy, most people are talking as if uh, Pocahontas could turn the canoe around and say, I don't think we want to go to this future because it doesn't sound all that good. And they thinking, well, we can just turn the canoe around and start paddling back up river. We're past the point where you can do that. See, so also what you're saying about, about, um, you know, basically getting out of my orbit. You've passed the event horizon already. Most people that have heard this stuff that I'm saying, you pass the event horizon where you can conceivably paddle away, <laughs> because people think. Well, the the you know, I, I posted something to say that people think that the point of the tipping point, the point of no return, it's not the flipping point. It's not the point of sinking. In the analogy of the Titanic. People think the point is when you have negative buoyancy. So the, the scientists and Michael E. Mann, what he, he's, he knows it's bullshit, but he, 
he's pushing this argument that, well, guys, until we have negative buoyancy, there's still stuff we can do. We can still bail a ship and stuff. And it's saying like, no, you can't. The, the tipping point is when you overwhelm the pumps. So in other words, when you can't bail water fast enough, the water's coming in faster than you can bail. That's the tipping point. So in other words, when Pocahontas turns the, the canoe around and starts paddling back upstream, she's past the point of, of, of no return or the tipping point when the current is, is faster than she can row. We're already there. See, we're, we're already there in our culture and basically how far advanced we've gone through the overshoots and all of that. We, we're already way past, if we turned around now and tried to row our canoe in the other direction, we're already past the event horizon of our ability to do that. So there's nothing we can do now. In other words, we can't bail our way out of the situation. We are going all the way through to the sinking. And then, so, you know, doomers realize that. They can say like, look, guys, we're paddling really fast and we're still going backwards. And so, you know, it, it's like all these activists and the climate uh, denial, <laughs> green tech and stuff, is they they all saying like, you know, paddle faster. What it means is we must paddle faster. That's what Michael Mann's saying. He's saying he knows that if we, we pass the venture right and he can see it. But he says like, no, this means we must just double down. We must just bail faster. And you see, only the doomers can see, like, I see that you can't, no way in hell can you bail faster than the water. You see, it's still ambiguous. A lot of people could say, no, 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 you, you, you can't say that. You don't know that. Maybe we get bigger buckets. Maybe we, maybe we just put more into it and stuff. And they say, like, well, doomers can see. Doomers can kind of do arithmetic. <laughs> and I can do a little, you know, little calculation on the back of an envelope. And I say, then. Bigger buckets are not going to do it. You don't have the strength in your arms. You don't have enough people. You just don't have the bailing ability. In other words, I'm saying you, the, you, the pumps on the ship are overwhelmed. So it's like, you know, then it's going to go down. It's just a matter of time before people will, will admit it. So the, the people here know that, right? Anybody on this call knows that the pumps are overwhelmed. But now that what they're saying is, the, the tipping point is when you have negative buoyancy. So in other words, the ship can no longer float because it's it's too full of water. It's saying, well, that's that's the the flippening, right? But but um, the then scientists think you know the Earth um, Earth sensitivity, climate sensitivity winds up at about three degrees. It's like no, that's the linear thinking that you had. You know, they're looking at pre-negative buoyancy and they're saying like and then in in by, by consistent with the metaphor they're saying in effect well then the deck will you know get get below the water line and that's where things will stabilize so no <laughs> basically the titanic has eight thousand feet of water under it it stabilizes when it hits the next solid thing which is the bottom of the mariana trench and scientists haven't got that in their heads yet they they have models and stuff that are that are based on going into the flip right in into the before the sinking there's a whole new regime after the sinking. so earth doesn't stabilize at three degrees it's not a, you know that's your linear thinking going in so in other words you know you don't really know where, where the sinking winds up but it could be venus i mean it looks like venus went through through this this thing it's done don't make assumptions about uh, how oh life will be okay the the tardigrades tardig will, will survive as like, No, I'm not so sure on this one, baby. But anyway, the the uh, you know the the preconditions are set, so they're pretty hairline, right? So so now this has a lot of implications, and one of them is is what decides this, and what decides you know what I say is the trajectory going in, the trajectory going out. It, it kind of metaphors for everything is poised on a sensitive point of dependence. So in other words, it's everything and the outcome is poised on a pencil point. So it's, uh, so we know we're going to go through a point of dynamic instability, right? That's a given. It's unavoidable now. But it, exactly what happens is dependent on the flap of a butterfly's wing. So, so it's, you know, people are thinking in terms of, well, we need a Manhattan project. And they say, no, 
you need to be really, really smart to get the right butterflies to do the right flapping so that you can, you know, make it through um, a period of, of chaos. Um, in, incredibly difficult to do, but this is, this is why I'm trying to impart the knowledge to you to, to, to actually do it. And so, the, so okay, so getting all the way back to the woo thing and the u, ufology and why, why I went there is because if, if you make, um, you see, I think the Mormons are in danger of this, the Ray Kurzweil's and all of these transhumanists, they in danger of going down the, the, the false path of interpreting all these phenomena and they, they complex phenomena that range from everything from, uh, you know, electromagnetism from geophysical processes as we get close to earthquakes and volcanoes to psychological things and the manifestation of um, UFOs and, thing, and paranormal stuff. And a lot, I can clearly see that a lot of people are going to interpret this as a big camp is going to say, this is the encounter with the aliens. So this is aliens coming down to us from outer space, which has implications, dangerous ones. Like, so we can let off nukes because they, if, if it's going to do any harm, they're going to protect us and intervene in the experiment and all sorts of dangerous shit, which is not true. So those, those guys can wipe out the planet because, you know, the guys in the Pentagon who are gearing up for interplanetary war, they're going to, you know, if, if I'm right, they're going to war against a manifestation of their own minds. So they could they could wipe us out just just you know shooting at their shadow in other words, or shooting at the Jungian shadow, our Jungian shadow. Can or I um, come in there? Can I? Yeah, go ahead. Just um, uh, there's a couple of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I meant to post it somewhere on Reddit, and I didn't, which was. Uh, what you just mentioned there about you know, going to war against a manifestation of your own mind. And uh, what came to mind was that 1950s science fiction film, The Forbidden Planet, um, where, uh, you know, the, the creatures that they were fighting were being manifested by the mad professor's um, convictions. It was interesting, though, uh, when I looked briefly at the Wikipedia entry for that, they felt that it was a... Uh, I think it was Wikipedia, at any rate, they felt that it was a recasting of Shakespeare's The Tempest, um, which, you know, I felt it was more true as a psychological story than as a traditional recasting. Um, so there was that about that film. Um, and the second thing is just... Um, you. I don't know if you want to say a couple of words about the difference between this manifestation of UFOs and the native experience with the ships appearing. Um, because one thing that occurred to me was um, that for people who aren't sucked into this illusion, if they just stand up and say, look, it's fucking bullshit. There's nothing there. Um, would will it have, would, would is there any way in which their illusion can be shattered by calling it to no, question? No, no. This is the problem. This is the problem. You see, you you stepped on a landmine there because there is something there. That's the problem. You see, I I thought in the manifesto I could brush it all aside and pretend there was. Nothing. <laughs> I realized some things are not going to work out for me very well that way. So so I have to go deeper into this than than I would like um, because. There is something there, and that's a problem. But just going back to to what you said about the tempest, so it's it's two things: it's the tempest and Midsummer Night's Dream. So the the, the tempest is uh, in the analogy of the natives and Cook. Uh, the tempest is like Prospero, who's a magician. So the the island in the tempest is is a a magical island. So it's the other way around. It's like the natives on the ship landing on a magical island. So Cook, the magic of European civilization and Wu is, um, is the island in this thing. It's kind of reversed from the experience of Cook. Or, you know, the so in other words, the, the historical Cook arriving in the, the native misinterpretation is like, you know, Prospero's island right, you know, arriving um, uh, to the to the natives, but in 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 the tempest, the natives arrive on the on the magical island. 
but it it is the um, the forbidden planet um it, the forbidden planet is is that also uh, all the elements are there so so shakespeare lay, laid them all out all pretty much the stuff that i'm i'm saying now so you you got to think of them in as as touchstones with all the the thing about caliban and stuff so caliban is more like um our right brain and uh you know that that kind of thing so um uh about you know caliban complains about writing and being taught words and things and is cursed by words and stuff so he's he's kind of like the represents the four lower layers and the 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 rest of the you know prospero um and aerial and all of that as all aspects of our psyche and particularly our alien cortex um actually in more depth i mean i just divide it into five layers because it's an easy uh it's an easy memoriam to just uh it's easily memorable to actually just have five layers but but check it goes in much deeper and and stuff so but it's it's a mixture of of the tempest and midsummer night's dream because the midsummer night's dream is it's pretty much the experience we all have the in case you didn't get what shakespeare was saying was he saying life as we know it is like a midsummer night's dream it's like for some unknown reason out of nothing we open up our eyes there's light sound action <laughs> and then we thrust into this play there's a lot of the plots already been been gone through and it's hard to catch up with what what you know what's gone before in the play and we know that it's coming to a big finale it's very hard to figure out you know what's going on behind the curtains how many what what's what's real what's not and you know you get to the end and poof lights go out again and that's it in, in infinite stretch of eternity you have this midsummer night's dream <laughs> so it's uh it's the experience of of you know the human experience of life is like consciousness that goes up comes down and that's it so it's, it's so uh, so now in that narrative there are a lot of people that think in terms of well you know it'll come again you know if it came no it's it doesn't see that's that's also a misinterpretation there's no reincarnation see what people say but how can you say oh well, if you if that's your trip i'll do the psychotherapy for you for for reincarnation but but see if you you get, did uh, um you did contradict yourself several meetings ago on that and unfortunately i never had the chance to get a clarification and i've lost the thread of it now unfortunately um maybe we should just park that for now i'll try and find what i what i, I did write a note about it at the time um uh so yeah we'll, we'll just look, just leave that well, for the time being if you see any inconsistencies like that in what i'm telling you we must go back and, and oh look up. i'm not i'm not saying it's an inconsistency i mean looking at it i appreciate the fact that it would not have been a contradiction it's just that you, you, you know i mean it was i felt it was obvious that you meant it in in a different way uh but it was still it still admitted of uh Incarn reincarnation in some particular uh, thing, you know. I mean, the, I think the problem is with the word incarnation. You know, meaning the flesh, physic, physical, something physical. Um, um, I, I think it was in respect of of uh, something like a, a certain uh, pattern of an individual's action in life if it had been very strong that maybe a, a certain amount of that that imprint might survive somewhere else maybe divided up amongst other people or just in the world somehow or another you, you didn't mean it in any yeah, literal sure. sense or any ego ego centered sense it was just like yeah, that the it, universe it's it's set up a little mean. people people mean they're conscious no no i so know they're, they're, but they're i think confused. that's you see you see yeah. why incarnation is, is bullshit is because because it's incarnate. Carne means meat. So it's saying, like, yeah, yeah, for, will I be able to step out of this meat into another meat meat sack? Yeah, yeah. And you say, like, no, absolutely, definitely not. Yeah, so basically, yeah. but you say, well, what about the pattern of me? I so say, like, sure, Craig Fenter, uh, you know, the first human genome to be sequenced is Craig Fenter. So essentially, 
all the information to recreate Craig Fenter is there. Is that meaningful? Or does it mean that if you created, you know, if you reassembled a DNA molecule, then you could clone Craig Fenter 100 years from now from the grave? No. Is that, uh, yeah. Well, maybe you could, but it's not Craig Fenter. It's, it's, it's not, not what he wants to be in re reincarnated because you would be using the same amounts of carbon, hydrogen, um, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and stuff like that. But, but you see, those are not the same molecules that Craig Fenter had. You know, whatever his dust is in the grave. You, you see, you, could, you can prove that it's a new Craig Fenter because you can go and dig up his old corpse and say, like, okay, we have a clone of him. It's, it's like cloning your dog or something. People clone their dogs. It's like it's a facsimile of the dog. It's a new living dog. But the old dog is dead, 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 dead. You see, that's what's, uh, this is important for transhumanists and stuff. This well, was so the other thing is, too, um, that, that, that e even if uh, you did, you know, recreate that person, they, they're not going to, they, are not going to recognize themselves as being, uh, as this being, uh, like, you know, there's going to be no, no sense of that at all within them, that, that, that whatever the new person is not going to think, oh, yes, and I'll just pick up and carry on from where I left off. There, there's no... There, it's just a very facile um, uh, I interpretation, you know. It's a rather childish way of looking at it, um, you know. Yeah. So I, I mean, as I said earlier, I'm not I'm not accusing you of contradiction because I know you what you said you would have meant it in a, in a much, uh, uh, you know, in a different way. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, yeah. So let's just just underline this. If, I, I, I think well, it was in a conversation where I, if my memory is good, where you. I think we were discussing uh, Kantian whole and and Matt um, the parts and the whole, you know, and uh, how they influence each other. I think that's where you were. At, I, if my memory is good, uh, I don't know, Gary. Do, yeah. do, do, do you remember that? No, I, I just, sorry, Sophie. I can't remember exactly where it came up, but I, I just remember that at the time I thought I'd really like to just get back and mention that again. To just to bring it up again, you know, um, because anyway, it's just fun to take pot shots at Lord here because he's always so right about everything else. And we... <laughs> well, no, it's, it's just, I'm just, putting them, I'm, I'm just getting the same pieces of the puzzle and reassembling them for yeah. you and say, like, the way yeah. you've got it doesn't quite fit. Stick it, stick it mm. this way, and they all fit together. And then as soon as I do that, then people go, oh, fuck, he's right. They do fit that way. Can we? And if if Can you I don't go? get that impression, we must go. But wait, man, I, I, I just feel the need to underline that thing about uh, reincarnation. Is that I think, imagine somebody comes to you today and says, "Gary, I've got some very important news for you. And that you'd never knew this, but you were a clone. You were a clone of this other Gary that lived in the 1800s. We we did this experiment. We dug up this body. We just." took one cell or, you know, a bit of hair or something, we sequenced all the DNA and we cloned you and you, clo and you clone. And then, you know, you could go, you could go and look and open up an old photo album and see there's the old Gary. And you say, like, you, you would identify with that person, but it would be another person. It's not you. You, you would say, oh, that's very familiar. It looks like me. It seems like me in another time, but it's un utterly inaccessible to that glorious thing that liberals love so much, your lived experience. So Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. So it's not you. Yeah. And that's basically what people are asking you, saying, uh, you know, I believe in reincarnation. What they're saying is, I hope I don't die. And you say, sorry, asshole, you die. <laughs> well, you're reinterpreting what, what my assumption is what you're saying is you are saying that they're lying to themselves. They're saying, but, but, but I, you uh, saying like, if you, if you think your kids are reincarnation of you, they are. My kids are reincarnation of my wife and me. 50, 50, mm. more or less of the coin toss each gene. <laughs> gene. But it's like, are they separate people? Am I half alive in them? It's, of course not. <laughs> because the, the, the thing that's asking that is my alien cortex. My alien cortex is stuck forever here. It, it is the part that will never, ever become part of the whole. And so when you die, you go back to the whole. <laughs> Literally in the hole. <laughs> and into the hole he goes. Can, uh, do you mind if we go back? Goes, right? it's, it's whole. It's like the, the jiva yeah. doesn't survive the body. Right? 
Um, can we go back just to where we were before with the, a few minutes ago with the UFO thing where I said, uh, you know, is it, is it possible to any extent to break their spell regarding their fixation on manifesting yeah. this? You know, I think we got off the track and we started talking about the Forbidden Planet. But, you know, like if you, if, if you, somebody was saying, you know, there it is, but the flying saucer's right there, you know, let's go up and have, you know, and, and you're insisting that there's absolutely fucking nothing there. Um, you, no, no. Would you have any, if, yeah, go on, elaborate then. Yeah, you see, this is dangerous stuff because, uh, yes, you can change the outcome the first thing you want to ask is why what do you want to achieve by taking away their their city <laughs> uh well only that they're gonna you know I, I mean i assume the assumption is that if they start going to war with this manifestation of their own mind it's going to be a pretty disastrous affair um okay, but if you if you if you put in an input that stops them doing that. They'll just do it in another way, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, you see, you haven't, the, the, we're dealing with a symptom here. And so if you, if you block that symptom, it's not the cause. The only way you can actually really change the outcome is, is with knowledge. It's, so it's, it's, it doesn't, doesn't help that you take away the cities. So see, it's quite hard to understand, but, uh, and it, because people have a funky view of free will and all sorts of stuff. But you see, I can, I can say, give you the knowledge now to, to, change, to change the outcome. But, but I would I'd say like, if you do that, you haven't got the wisdom and it's the wisdom <laughs> that you need to survive, not the knowledge. So in other words, you could be clever and take away their city, but like, that doesn't do anything for anybody. It's like you, it's it's like taking taking the slave out of the plantation. You still need to take the plantation out of the slave. So it's like the, what we're at war against is with our own alien cortex. So I can I can I can tell you how to thwart the alien cortex, but it's it's the battle of the ages. They'll just come back with a new thing. You you really have to annihilate the alien cortex and the only way to do that is is with wisdom it's it has to annihilate itself so you just just it's almost better that we just go and you know just nuke ourselves if that is our level of wisdom in in a certain kind of way it's not my personal choice but but you see there are worse paths to go down right oh you can make things worse you see you see Part of being wise is to have the knowledge and not deploy it. You see, I can give you, I can give you the information that will allow you to have like counter cities. You could be Harry Potter against the Voldemort and stuff. But it's 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 bullshit because you all you know unless you. This is one of the reasons why I hate J.K. Rowling is there's no character development in it. You know, Harry Potter's you, the good guy with you know, a bit beaten up with glasses. Voldemort's the epitome of evil. What do they do? They all have a big battle. And in the end, it's like, well, evil is defeated. And it's like, really? I mean, I can, I don't really see them as all that different. It's, you know, I, mean, I know everybody else goes like, what well, can't you see that Harry's the good guy and Voldemort's the evil guy? And say, not, not as easily as you can. <laughs> it's like, just because you don't identify with them. Of Voldemort and they give him a funny nose and stuff and make him feel like the other. It's like, you know, maybe he's just a different form of life. I can easily see it from his point of view. Just because he likes wearing black doesn't mean it's like he's the horror of the ages. I mean, what makes him so damn terrible? He's like, he's just trying to live like Harry Potter. So there's no development. They never reach any wisdom. So it's basically, if, if there was some, it's not exactly Shakespeare's that, I mean, Voldemort has never transformed they never switch, they, they never get to the point of reflection where Harry Potter turns out to be more evil than Voldemort, Voldemort turns out to be the good guy, and then nothing, no transformation, no flip, it's dead. It's a, that, that whole series is just fucking awful. 
So, I mean, that? but what's the extension of this? You, the, 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 so the extension is, is that you would go up against all these guys, the, say the Pentagon and stuff that's about to have this war, and it's, it's like, well, okay, now you've set yourself in opposition against their cities. And so it's like, well, you know, are we getting anywhere here? <laughs> it's like, it's a, um, no, no, I mean, I mean is, the... is an, you know, basically a collaborator with the aliens. Yeah, now what the, the sense in which I meant that was, um, uh, all right, you let them go ahead with their annihilation of these imaginary, uh, these uh, these creations. Uh, is that necessarily going to teach them any, or, or might have them arrive at any point of wisdom that they they're not going to get? Uh, you know, if you were to disabuse them of their illusion in the first place, are they going to be in any better position after they've got, you know? had all these alien wars. You see, you can't fix stupid. You see, what, what's, what's Im implied in, in your, your thinking is a lot of ego. So it, it's implied is that, that you know better than them, that, that you know, you, you have an outcome that's superior to theirs and, uh, you know, you're prepared to fight for it. And stuff. All of these things are contradictory. They're self-contradictory in, in the same way as dare I say it, this recent interview we had with, uh, um, you know, with somebody on really left wing and stuff. And so, so you, the only way out of this kind of dualistic thinking is basically getting to, the, is, is to transcend it. So if you think in terms of the, the left wing thing, and people say, like, you say, well, why, why don't you talk to, you know, this outside group? And I say, well, well, no, you're not going to talk to them. They're racists. So, like, you see how self-contradictory it is. It's like, why won't you talk to racists? Because they're fucking mm. intolerant. So no, it's like, the point okay, I meant, so that wasn't, to yeah. you this outside group because basically they're intolerant. Isn't that intolerant? <clears throat> you see, but it's, it's only through looking at the mirror where people, the, the alien cortex has to defeat itself. And the analogy for it is the, the Hindu thing with the shampoo and the tigers, you know, going round and round the tree till they melt themselves to butter and the churning of the ocean of milk in the, you know, in Thailand, you see all that tradition and stuff. So it's, you have to do the churning. You have to basically put things in the crucible and, uh, and the crucible and the alchemy has to go to completion. Like, you know, the alchemical process has to go to completion. You can't trick it and say, well, can we trick the eggs into becoming the milk? And can we stop the milk becoming this? It's like, no, it's like either this may, either this recipe works or it doesn't. You can't force the recipe into something it's not. And the fact that you're trying to do that is something that needs to be addressed. If you're looking for an issue, it's not the guys in the, in the Pentagon. It's, it's you and your thinking that the Pentagon needs to be restrained or something. Does that make and any sense? But tell me, Gary used the word um, magic spell to, to, to dissipate the, the, the evil uh, UFO, alien wars, etc. But is casting of spells also a manifestation of our, of our ego too? Because we are right, we are, you know. Um, yes, but a good one. There was a lot of things about <laughs> spells recently on the, on the sub. And I was kind of yeah. looking at it. I was trying to be a bit humorous about it, but... I, I've looked a bit deeper into that, and I, I just, uh, I'm a bit confused about that. I've always been interested in that, but uh, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? Okay, so, okay, well, let me fill you in here. So, okay, this is a good point, and, and this is actually on the agenda to talk about spells. So let me tell you that, first off, spells really, really work. They absolutely work. They work like, like Billy Ho, just... I'm not so sure they work on the target. <laughs> That's a bit hidden this. But they work on the pro practitioner. They really, really work on the practitioner. So it's kind of like um, this guy. Uh, I, I think I'm going to share more about my history now because I, I'm starting, I started to realize during the week and after I started revealing some of the stuff in the last meeting that, that I realized that enough water has gone under the bridge that I can start like naming names and places and stuff because it's getting to the point where people are 
unlikely to be able to track me down from, the, <laughs> from that past history. And if they tried, they would go down a rabbit hole that's so deep to, to catch up with me. So, so, but, um, no, but, so let me tell you the story then. Or, or do you want to say one thing and then I'll tell you? Yeah, the I do, because otherwise we're going to leave, leave entirely what you were talking about a minute ago. Uh, I'm, if you can bear with me. Um, that, uh, no, I, I'm not claiming to, to, for a start, I wasn't suggesting that we use a spell or anything to, 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 to dispel their illusion, simply just to point it out. Um, but, um, uh, and it's not from the point of view, um, Let's put it this way, you know, like supposing you, you disillusion them, that doesn't necessarily cause any great awakening. Um, and, but, if you, but my contention was that if you let them just let, let the whole thing rip, that, that doesn't seem to either. So I guess it comes down to the question is, well, why, why are you even bothering to tell us about this? Just, just let it all... You know, because where where does the wisdom get inserted anyway? Where how's, how will that arise out of you this? Need to know uh, what how you're would how would order to survive? Right. So so in other words, okay, let's go back to the analogy of Cook. But yet it's still assuming we're, that we're, we're in native. some special position. Well, well, you see, the, like I, you know, I'm only influencing people that can actually see these videos and yes, no, and even then, only as much attention as they'll give me, which is not a lot. So it's, it's like, it's almost nothing. And my contribution and influence is close to zero. But the, um, think of it in terms, but it's, it's, if you have this information, this is as much information I can give you to be able to survive. And to be able to survive, you need to be able to interpret the, the situation and what's going on. So in, in other words, in terms of Cook arriving, we're the natives on the shore. I'm telling you that like, how things go after Cook arrives, it's not sweetness and light, and then we all like join hands and you know become um, you know we 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 all happy families after that. It might start out that way, but basically there has to be a reconciliation between the European culture and the Aborigine culture, and it might take uh, it's it might be fairly dramatic, but either way, there's going to be fucking shooting <laughs> there's going to be blood and shooting this is not all happy families right so so in other words even if even if i was completely wrong and there are aliens out there and they are landing on the planet is is the end of that story is just the reconciliation of alien culture and our culture and it, it would be pretty darn dramatic you could write off a few planets and a chuck in a few planetary wars and a few sagas that would make Star Wars run for an, for another twenty episodes before you you can reconcile reconcile such such huge opposites. So so now to, to navigate that territory, you're going to have to know that like oh here here's the part that you told us about. This is the part where the natives go up and offer pineapples to cook. You say yeah okay. Then you say and now what's the next stage? Now the next stage is the guys on the deck are Randy sailors. And they're looking at all these topless women. So you can already see some cultural problems right here. And so you say, what's the end result? Well, you're probably going to get a mutiny on the thing. The randy sailors are going to start you know, coming ashore, finding excuses to come ashore so they can see more of the woman. You're know, like, oh, okay, who told us the story? Now, everybody else is like, they... They uh, they're not getting ahead of the curve. They're not interpreting this very well. If you if you're going to survive all this, you're going to be you're going to have to say like, okay, now everybody's jumping in the canoe to take pineapples out to the ship, and you're saying like, am I going to do this? No. You told me that basically lock up your daughters. The next bit's not going to be pretty, <laughs> you know. And so I'm trying to get you ahead of all of this so that you you can survive. What are, other people are we are not are through. we not at risk of of engaging in a, in a, uh, ego-driven exceptionalism by by being by being yes. like that. Yes, it is. You know? It is. But you yeah. see, you need a little bit. You see that? Okay. So all of this stuff is contradictory. But yeah. it, it, you have to get rid of your ego to survive. So in other words, the, the impetus to survive um, is is ego. But it's. Uh, you need a little drop of ego 
because you, you need the seed crop needs to basically to become the, the seed crop. You, you have to preserve a little bit of ego, but that ego has to be preserved with knowledge that it is just an ego. So in other words, you, you're not talking from that ego, you're talking from the bigger whole. So, so in other words, I'm talking mm -hmm. in terms of Kantian wholes, it's like mm -hmm. you identify with the whole. You're prepared to preserve yourself and ego because you want the whole to carry on. And if, if it's necessary for the whole to carry on, that's like, if look, put another way, I'm not completely vested in, in surviving. See, what my goal is to make sure that there's a seed crop so the Kantian whole survives. If it means that, well, I'm called forth to repopulate the earth, well, I'll do my duty. But it's like, that's not my goal. What uh, People are who are operating from a different level, they, they're talking about things like, you know, I, I need to survive. I'm going to survive. I, you know, screw everybody else. I'm going to, it's like, yeah. the chance of you making it through with that attitude, zero, zero. I'm going to give you a goose egg. You see, you see, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, just because humanity goes through, predestined to go through a huge metamorphosis and enlightenment, don't make the wrong assumptions that 7.8 billion people suddenly see the light. 7.8 billion people more or less are bit players that are going to be toast in the story. They, their destiny is to get a sword through the head. <laughs> the vast majority of people are, are, are not going to get it. So, so people say like, well, you know, do you think you can pull this off? Have a epitome, you know, again, this Delphic oracle thing, you know, it, it, you make these assumptions. Everybody makes assumptions. So you say like, Hugh, do you think you could really make a global enlightenment so all in humanity is, um, is, is enlightened and goes through this metamorphosis? And you say, yes. Oh, that's arrogant. You can get 7.8 billion people to get enlightened? I say, no, you're making a terrible assumption there. Maybe there's only one. I only have to enlighten one person. We're going through a tremendous bottleneck here. Maybe it's just Noah and his wife or <laughs> a few concubines that I'm talking to here. Maybe this is a lot easier job. You see, everybody has these false assumptions. Like the whole of humanity is going to go through this epiphany. Yes. Oh, that's going to be a mass epiphany. Yeah, you call five people mass. Yeah. <laughs> so always in these things, they're Delphic. You have to really tease them out. But it, in essence, it's it's getting rid of people's false assumptions. Is is a large part of this work. Eventually, the clever, the clever ant you mentioned earlier. Yeah, there, there are not many of these beats. I gotta say, <laughs> like we're talking one. If you're lucky, so so the yeah, basically Adam and Eve is like maybe it's Adam and Eve. Yeah, it's like like. Don't, you know, don't make any assumptions. <laughs> you see, it's you, you have to examine these assumptions one by one by one, and then somewhere along the line, people are going to fall and say, like, okay, well, I'm not it. But then you say, oh, well, then you, your job becomes, you know, making sure that, you see, that at the highest guns, okay, let's use that analogy again from you. There are only two players. There's only, it's kind of an Adam and Eve thing, right? Because all the rest are spectators. They all become, you know, eaten by the Black Widow to support the children. <laughs> Basically, they're sacrificial to the feast, right? All, all, the, all the observers to the Hyrus Gammas are sacrificial to the feast. They don't know it. Most of them don't know it. The early, the early feast, <laughs> the guys go down without knowing. They, they're basically sheep. They don't know what the hell's going on. But then... The last guys on the table, they actually do get voluntarily sacrifice themselves with full knowledge. And that's a different crowd at time. So it's like, it depends how long you last into the feast, right? So if, if you're a liberal, you're going to last up to the grid going down. And then that's pretty much the end of your, your part. You, we're in Act 3. You're not going to make it much past uh, very deep into Act 3. And... Um... Sorry, but do you think you could uh, go back to what uh, you were started on spells and their relation? I mean, all the, the posts that have been. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank Thanks you. for bringing me back on track there. So, the, yeah. So, the um, 
let me tell you the story about how how spells work. And so, so I was re saying I got to reveal more of I can safely reveal more of myself. So okay, I, I've told you that like I was fired once for calling um, calling the Mormon cult a cult. Um, so the the whole company like okay, this is a defense contractor, right? and uh, they they all essentially Mormons. <laughs> The Mormons are infiltrated up and down. It's horrendous, horrendous. But anyway, the essentially, uh, you know, I was on a six months project, uh, and so essentially, as far as I can tell, they assigned this guy to convert me to Mormonism. So they stick me with him, working with him on this project, and uh, uh, much younger than me. But uh, you know, the typical guy that would knock on your door as a Mormon, and uh, and so. You know, he, he spending endless hours. I mean, these guys were really horrendous about how they clock watched you and everything. But they would allow this guy to spend hours and hours and hours philosophizing and to give, basically giving me the hard sell on Mormonism. And so, but like what he wasn't ready for was <laughs> I was up for it in a big way. And I, I read the Book of Mormon and I said to him, look, you're, you're trying to convert the very last guy on this planet that's ever going to be converted to Mormonism. And he went, like, oh, no, you like the challenge, you know. And so I said, okay, I'll make it back with you. I said, you try and convert me to Mormonism, and I'll try and make you an atheist. And at the end of this project, we see who does best. Right? So then what? So then you chink away on the philosophical things and stuff. And and then I, the first the first time I really got under his armor, was when, when I said to him, you know, at first he was thrilled because I it, this was the first time he had ever meet, met somebody that would actually read the Book of Mormon cover to cover and <laughs> like uh, and really, you know, get into it. I mean, all to shoot it down. I had no intention of believing a page of it, but I wanted to get to the bottom of it and Joseph Smith and his thinking and all of that. But the first the first chink that I got in this guy's armor was I said to him, like I said. Have you actually converted? And he went, no, no, no. And so I said, like, I said, did you go on mission? He said, yeah. All Mormons go on mission, by the way. So it's like when when they get to about 19, they send them on to South America. This guy went to South America and spent a year in South America just you know knocking on doors and trying to convert people. And I said to him, so you spent a year in South America, and how many people did you convert? And he said, well, one. So I said, okay, you went and you changed somebody's mind and now they're Mormon and uh, they're still Mormon today. And he said, well, no, they kind of lapsed. So I said, okay, you spent a year in South America on mission and uh, you didn't convert a single person. And he said, yeah. But he's going to convert me, right? <laughs> so I said, so the first chink I got under his armor was I said, no, you're wrong. You did convert somebody in South America. And he went, no, I didn't actually. You're right. I didn't convert a single person. No, you did. said, the reason why they sent you to South America was to convert the one person that you converted. He said, no, I didn't convert anybody. I said, you did. He said, who? He said, you. That's why they sent you. <laughs> See, mission, they send all these kids on mission all around the world and they go for a year and to all these exotic places and stuff because they 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 uh, they don't expect to recruit people to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. They want to re reestablish the the church in the in the missionary. <laughs> so so the idea is to convert the missionary, not the not the not the target, not the, the damned. So you know the and it it works because if if you've spent a year arguing all the crap for mormonism it it really seeps in and you convince yourself right you make no progress on anybody else but it certainly sinks in and then you you have a problem of commitment it becomes much harder to leave the mormon church when you have a sunk cost so if you've sunk a year into the mormon church it's much more difficult than, than to, to be an apostate and say, look, I've wasted so many years of my life. Um, it's all nonsense and I'm leaving. It's like, well, you know, you've, 
you say, really, you're going to throw up the investment? For most people, it's just easier to carry on lying and to say like, oh, the, and then not have to suffer the ego trauma of, you know, the wounded hurt of saying like, you've been a fool for so many years. So the more years they can get, this is, this is a part of the cult. The more years they can get you to be a fool and invest in a cult, the less likely you are to defect. And now, don't forget, that applies to you know, enlightenment humanism. They, they put One of the reasons they put you through school and through higher education is not, is, it, it's, I mean, it's all rubbish. I mean, have you ever used anything really for out of you that you learned in school or college? It's nothing. It's, it's, it's just a filtering process. They're just putting you through an ordeal so that they can give you a certificate. And you say, well, they're not actually imparting knowledge or anything like they're pretending. They just want you to invest in this cult, this um, you know, enlightenment cult, progressive cult. And so then basically once you've got your sense of identity, your diploma, you've got your, your PhD, you've, you've argued and argued and argued and stuff, you've absolutely converted yourself. And the chances of you ever defecting from the true faith of progressive transhumanism is close to zero. It's easier to just fight off other people and other arguments than it is to change yourself. Now, spells work exactly the same way. With you, in, you as the you see, it's very good to do a spell, and I think we should. See, what, what you're doing there, so I suggest we do a spell to bind Moloch. Now, uh, it's very good, but you see, I, as me as the cult leader, I win, right? Because the more you actually do spells and stuff, the more I'm reinforcing in crowd and the cult. And the more I'm establishing the outbreak, you see, what will happen is a lot of people will that are sitting on the fence will look at this and say, oh, well, you know, Hugh and the Extinction Army, they used to be fun, but like they really gone weird now. They started doing weird spells and shit like that. And uh, like, not for me. And they'll kind of like defect. But then uh, that's the price. But the, the people that are already involved, they, you know, 10 times more committed. So it's like, if you think of it in terms of an army, you, you'd, it's better to have a, a hundred zealots than it is to have a thousand people that are unaligned and completely just fly by night, right? And so, you know, if you this is the problem with uh, XR and Joe Rogan and all of these people is is they like they are loose affinity group. So in other words, they're a cult, but they don't have much gravity, and everybody's unaligned. So then they can easily dissociate. See, what, what, what I tried to convince some people that you know well of in, and made headway, but again, there's too much baggage. You know, again, I had this problem with the uh, XRs that I, I got through as like the, to the person you know who I'm talking about. I absolutely convinced him. But he, he reverted back to, well, you know, I've spent so many years studying civil disobedience. So it's just too much. Although there he knew exactly what I said was he knew he even said the words like nothing works none of this stuff well everybody's been teaching for the last thirty years doesn't work those are the words straight out of his mouth but then you say like okay now I'll tell you what works and he works straight away he saw that yeah it's better to have a small core of highly committed zealots and grow it from there than it is to have a broad tent of people that are utterly unaligned. And so, you know, so you're based on a, but you couldn't get, get rid of all the other thing about his whole shtick was movement building and put the biscuits on the table and say like, look, if you put the biscuits on the table, the center of attraction, the cult, basically the biscuits are the cult leader. The guy, the animals are only coming to the table because you gave them a bit of sugar. So it's like, it's like the the cult is forming around the biscuits on the table. It's not forming around the cult leader or the ideology or anything. So it's like, oh, of course it's going to disappear because it, it, all the members will fall into orbit around some other center of gravity, like animal rights or gender issues or something. It's all going to splinter. And so so anyway, these are the basic tenets of movement building. But anyway, it's because they ran contrary to Gene Sharp and all these people with ulterior motives, then basically you could see the truth of it, but like couldn't give up his old habits. And so that's the problem. So now getting back to a spell, now is it, 
now, uh, Miss Venture, having got you, hopefully convinced you so far, now I must add a little woo to this picture. So if you do a spell, right, and I think we should, um, we should ease into it a little bit, just as, as much as tolerant. It's basically you should use somebody like <clears throat> Ryan or somebody that's quite rational and reasonable to as a touchstone. If yeah, if if Ryan didn't approve of what we're doing, we should really not do it because it basically is <clears throat> he's a good point of reference, so we don't, we don't go too far. Um, and I'll go into the reason why you don't you don't want to abandon reason. You see, one of the reasons why I hate one of the reasons why I hate Harry Potter and that is is because it's it's three hours of violations against physics and reason. I mean, it's it's like it's like being for me. It's like being in J.K. Rowling's dream space. Is the the Victorians right? The Victorians had a bit of etiquette, a bit of manners that was well established, and we've forgotten. But it was a rule that you don't discuss your dreams. So you don't. The Victorians would never sit around the the you know with tea and cakes and say like, "Did you have did you have a good rest last night, Cynthia?" And Cynthia, you know, now people would go, no, I, I, I had a really terribly restless night. Um, I had this dream and it was so weird. You know, there was this table that turned into a cat and this book was, you know, had teeth and it was basically going in, into J.K. Rowling. Now, there was a big taboo against saying that because it was a big social part to talk about. Yeah, the reason is it's so damn boring. There's nothing more agonizing. It's like root canal therapy to somebody to hear your dreams because it's an entirely personal dreamscape that has, no, and, unless you Jung or Freud or something and you can get something out of the symbolism in the dream, but for the average Victorian, it's just a, a long stream of bullshit that you put, you're imposing on everybody else in the room while you go off in your, your Harry Potter world and, you know, it's all dungeons and dragons and terribly exciting to you. But it's utterly, utterly nauseating to everybody else. And so I, I feel that while watching Harry Potter, that I'm put through <coughs> J.K. Rawlings' incoherent dreamscape. And, <coughs> and so, so, yeah, and then, then the, the offense to reason is like from start to finish in Harry Potter is an offense to reason. It's like, first of all, I can't really understand, what, <coughs> as I mentioned, why Voldemort <coughs> is, so, is so evil. I mean, Okay, he. I don't remember if I remember the story. I had to suffer through all this, by the way, because I, I have kids. So other, otherwise, I would never, never have sat through these movies. But, but I, from what I, what I remember, he had to kill seven people, one for each one of the Horcruxes or uh, something like that. And then that's the source of why you know Riddle is such a evil guy. So, but really, seven guys. I mean, this guy's epochal. You know. Satan incarnate. And so, I mean, Tony Blair killed 10,000 people in Iraq and probably baths in adrenochrome every morning, but like they gave him a fucking knighthood. So is Voldemort really? I mean, what's Voldemort trying to do? He's just trying to do what everybody else is trying to do, but he's trying to live forever. And so, yeah, that's, I mean, Jeff Bezos killed seven people in, in his company last week. And uh, that's, that's been recorded. It's just, just by not allowing them to have heart attacks and bathroom breaks and stuff, he killed seven people. It's like, Jeff Bezos is still a good guy, apparently. It's like, why, why isn't Jeff Be Bezos, uh, why is he celebrated and not vilified as Voldemort? So it, it didn't make any sense why all of the stuff. And then, and then it's like, you know, the Ministry of Magic and everybody is like, well, all the forces of Armageddon are arriving against Voldemort and stuff. And so like, if you, you know, really, is this a big problem? I mean, why don't you just get a Barrett rifle from two two miles away and just take the bastard out? I mean, is this is this problematic for the Ministry of Magic? I mean, just you have a visibility cloak, just creep up with him and then, you know, put a put a fucking cap in his ass. <laughs> it's like it's like no, no, the the whole world, the future of Manichaean society, good and evil are poised against him. What do we do? Uh, get the kid with the fat glasses. Really? Why not just nuke the bastard? I mean, come on. And they, and they they go around with the Horcruxes, finding the Horcruxes and everything. It's like they have to do all these 
looking in crystal oh. balls and stuff. And, it's, it's, uh, and all I'm saying is like, you know, if, if this was my movie, I'd say like, why don't you just kill Voldemort first and then go after the Horcruxes? Your job would be way easier. But then, then you know, but anyway, why, why go through all this trouble of all these movies to find all these Horcruxes one by one? It's just like say, just do it over in one movie. Say like, uh, Voldemort, we found all your Horcruxes and they are destroyed. How did you find them? Did you look in the crystal ball, the shriving mirror? Did you talk to the snake? He said, nah, we just tracked your cell phone. Oh, damn, I had my cell phone off. But yeah, CIA is a back door. Even if your cell phone's off, we can still track it. You just follow you, found the whole practice, took an afternoon, and now bang. It's like, it would be a way better movie if, if, if J.K. Rowling had put real physics in it. So, okay, so here's one of the things that, for using it for, for Wu and give you one of the guardrails for Wu. This is where people go wrong with Wu. Harry, you see, I'm looking at Harry Potter. Everybody's like, Harry Potter and Voldemort in the final scene, and they go with the, the, the wands, and there's a huge amount of, you know, plasma and stuff, and it's one's green and blue and red, or whatever, and it's a, a very symbolic and a lot of, and here's me thinking, where's all this energy coming from? It's just like, it's like, okay. It's like, I have seen incredible Wu stuff, and I'll go into it in detail if you need me to, but I have never seen a violation of physics. I've seen physics that you don't know of, but I've never seen conservation of matter and energy and stuff. It's like, so, okay, let me give you an example. In, in my cult, where I, I mentioned one thing about how we were in this kind of chain gang passing doors to each other just throwing them through the air we were standing you know meters apart and they just kind of sailed through the air it's like never once did we violate physics okay so it is very unusual part of physics and a lot of things which michael Shermer would say is not possible but we never once used a joule of energy that we didn't get out of eating our wheat so 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 uh, so I'll say in in that schoolhouse, what we call the schoolhouse, and that was there are many ha houses in this cult, and and they manor houses, right? They manor, literally manor houses like Downton Abbey. I mean, literally. <laughs> and the life is, you know, as a young guy, and they're like, I would polish brass and scrape embers and keep the fire stoked and just, you know, basically, you know, be like one of the the guys below stairs. It was wonderful, wonderful experience. Wonderful, wonderful time. And all of these things happened. It was like living in Hogwarts. But all of the stuff, when you saw the stuff, that's the the light, the sattva, all these unusual things of unusual strength, telekinesis, all of that, is like they, they never once were accounted for in energy. So during those those spells where we, where those we would have those uh, you know kind of week long uh, retreats and stuff at those places, they would use a hell of a lot of energy. I mean, literally, the food and the wine and all the stuff that came in, every jewel that that was expended came in through the door from produce and stuff. So, so one of the things, yeah. It, very unusual, sitting down at a table, having a meal. There, there was this thing that they used to say that in uh, in good company, you can't get drunk. I think that was a, a kind of a Victorian saying. It was very Victorian. Uh, this was a guy called Leon McLaren, and he was just kind of a misplaced Victorian um, of the Madame Blavatsky kind of, if you could imagine that. But the, um, you know, the... You, we would have, I mean, literally, you'd have bottles of wine per person in one of these things. And you would need that. You know, people's heads would glow. And, uh, you know, the, it, it, but like that came at a price. And the, but nobody would get drunk. And the reason is that all of this energy, what you're really opening up, all the, you know, people talk about channeling, channeling and stuff like that. But it really is what I was talking earlier about the disconcordances and stuff is after working on yourself, doing philosophy or sorting out your ideas, you, you are literally opening up, I would guess, if 
the physiology is you're opening up these these clogs, these these nexuses, these inconsistencies, literally in the microtubules in your brain, in in the axons and stuff. You're having a free free flow path. And you, most people can't do that. They're all at odds with themselves, with their colleagues and stuff. And so they, you know, if, if, if uh, in the average person, the average Joe, if you're sitting in a coffee shop having a philosophical discussion, it goes you know, the way it, it's, it's a blocking conversation. Immediately, you make some progress, make some insight. You have the guy that I keep on saying is the cop comes in. And that, that cop is your alien quarter. So you make some proposition. You make some uh, thesis, immediately anti antithesis. So, you know, the Hegelian dialectic, they say, well, then from that comes the synthesis. Yeah, in your dreams. Normally, they just block. So it's like whatever your mate says in the coffee shop, is go, go and try it. Make some assertion. And the, the bolder your assertion is, the, the more resistance you'll get to it. But it's unthinking, reflexive resistance. Just Bang. Like that. I mean, just to look on social media. You just put anything out on social media that, like, would, you know, conceivably, if everybody got on board, it would be like improv. So, the, so the reason why improv works is because everybody knows that's done any acting or anything would, it, would tell you the reason in, the first rule of improv is yes and. So, it's, is you affirm that whatever. So, somebody acts something in improv, comes out with some proposition, and you say, yes, you acknowledge, affirm it, and, and then extend it. And that's where the, the magic comes in, to, to improv. But in this person that somebody's trained, and in, in a cult like this, you're being trained subtly to, to, to not be so oppositional and then, and then you see Michael Shermer or Singer or something say, yeah, but the cult leader get, uses all these techniques to get you, you know, persuasion and confirming and stuff. Yeah, that's one way to look at it because you're looking from the outside. Another way to looking at it is you're doing hard work to get rid of preconceptions, to get rid of all these inconsistencies in your thinking. And so basically you start to see what might be the truth that opens up all these channels. I mean, literally opens up you, you. So in other words, it's scientific. You could go and measure the galvanic response or measure the, the amount of electricity. So you just look at somebody's oxygen consumption. So in, in those environments with full of sattva where everybody's literally, sometimes you could see halos around people's heads and say like, so it's, it's, you can measure it. You, you can go and see that it's like, get a camera. You can take a picture. The, the, that light is there. And, the, and the, you know, the, it is conventional physics. It's just outside of physics because, you know, Michael Shermer and the boys and Randy and stuff, um, uh, they, they just believe that, you know, the, the human brain's a lump of meat. So they say, well, yeah, if, if you believe that the human brain is a lump of meat, it is. Because of this tautology, as you're saying, like, it, we have telekinetic powers, we have superpowers, and the, the superpowers also comes in the form of a cop. So wh whatever you say becomes this infuriating for Michael Shermer's, is this infuriating tautology? Is there like, yeah, it'll be whatever you believe. Michael Schumer will never sit down to one of these dinners and 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 get uh, you know and see all of this stuff because he he wouldn't even watch the entry level. So the, there's a big filter into getting into you know the cult because most of the Michael Schumers will be filtered out easy. Say this is horseshit and walks. So like, well. He's made it horseshit. Basically, he would never get onto the stuff that, you know, unless he, he got deeper, opened his mind a little bit, got deeper in. Now, Dickie Dawkins and say, say like, yeah, we want to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brain runs out of your head. Say, no, you do. See, you want to be open-minded enough so your brain runs out your head. So what what that means is to, to Dickie Dawkins is, is Dickie Dawkins is talking about his alien cortex. So Dickie Dawkins is saying, like, you don't want to be so open. Let me translate what Dickie Dawkins is saying. So you don't want to be so open-minded that you lose the cop. Say, so you have to be. 
you, you will be stuck in Dickie Dawkins' Darwin dystopia. In Ness, you can actually learn to anesthetize the cop. So the prerequisite is, you know, the cop standing right there. You know, in essence, you're, you're in a cell with, in a panopticon with the cop standing right there. And so it's basically the first thing you've got to learn to do is either hypnotize, dope, something to get rid of the cop. If, if you can anesthetize the cop, a whole world of possibilities opens up and you'll start to see all these things. Now, now you will not see Harry Potter style magic. You see, the, you see this is the where these guys have gone all wrong, like Timothy Leary. He, Timothy Leary, okay, he opens. This is why you can't use drugs. You can't use drugs because they, the drugs are worthless. They, you, they let you experience all these stuff. But if you don't understand the mechanism and what you're looking at, you're going to act like a fool, like Timothy Leary did. Timothy Leary then gets a whole, you know, they have their perception opened up, the doors of perception are opened up because they have a little psilocybin and a bit of LSD. Okay, good for you. It's like, now what happens? Now we get all the hippies together and we sit on the grass and try and levitate the Pentagon. That, that's Harry Potter. See, I, you see, if there was a wiser person around, they would have gone and say, Timothy, old boy, I know you like your LSD and shit, but like, let's do a little back of the envelope calculation here. It's like, how heavy do you think the Pentagon is? I mean, name it. How many tons? Say, okay, and it's rooted in foundations. Okay, how much energy, name it, kilojoules here, do you think you need to elevate it to 20 feet? So like, well, a lot of energy, like, you know, of nuclear bombs worth at least. Say, so, do you think all these little hippies who barely had tofu and vegetable this morning, if you look at all the calories in the tofu and vegetable, it's like, you know, can you really get, how much quinoa salad do you actually need to get all this energy to raise the Pentagon? You, see, you, don't, you don't violate the laws of physics. You, can't, you see, he thought... Oh, you can just do woo and then, you know, defy laws. No, <laughs> doesn't work that way. So, so you might say, oh, but but you you you're the cop. You you being self-limiting, and it's like saying, you're saying, uh, you you holding yourself back from doing really really amazing stuff like elevating the Pentagon. I say, no, you're being an idiot. Say so, because it 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 works like this, right? There's an old thing in in uh, Hinduism, and so if you look at, say, the Bhagavad Gita, there are always these commentaries and all these sages and stuff. And depending on how good a sage you were, you could get to be um, a commentary, a commentator, and um, the Shankaracharya and all these these pods. They all have these commentaries, and often the commentaries are objections. So they they introduce the cop, and and say. Well, in, in a Socratic format where they would say that the student objects blah de blah and raises this objection, what Gary's doing to me now. And then the master explains so that the student then can get a better interpretation and has a bit to, to work on. Now, one of the questions, and, and a lot of them is kind of quite adversarial, like especially in the Zen school, they like really try and like screw the master up and that's good. Because you, you you really want to like throw some punches and see see if the master is any good at deflecting them, but but one of the classics was that that uh, they say like uh, okay we kind of pharisaical a bit like Jesus talking to the Pharisees and they trying to screw him up and trying to get him to to do a misstep because if they can get him to say something like don't pay your taxes to the Romans that's it they they won they've got him on a cross right there <laughs> but they can never do it because Jesus is always like. I see where you're coming with that. And he always outfoxes them. So you have this lot of one-upmanship, and that's that's the process of getting wiser. Um, and, and so there's this work, this work is well worthwhile because out of this is distilling the essence of wisdom. But anyway, the one of the questions, one of the real gotcha pharisaical questions is, is like, okay, if God is omnipotent, the supreme God, okay, Forget the Christian God, Atman. So if the Atman, if the essence of the conscious universe, panpsychic universe, 
is, is conscious and all-powerful, then, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, by the way, is all about law and the laws of money. It's like the Aryans are kind of imposing law on the barbarians. So it's like saying then, is God subject to God's laws? Aha! Got you, Mr. Master. Because if you say, no, it's all Wu, they say, God can omnipotent. God can do whatever God wants, even violate his own laws. And you say, ah, okay. So the laws are bullshit. The laws are dependent on your power. If I can get as powerful as God, I can also violate his law. So all these terrible arguments come up. So like, then you, if the master answers, no, then the God is, cannot violate the laws of physics and his own laws, then you're equally in problematic territory because you have to say like, well, then he's not really omnipotent, like you said. The, it's basically the God is not really God. The law is God because even God can't violate the law. Therefore, we should be worshiping the law and forget the Atma. Kind of what we're doing with progressivism, right? We're, we're worshiping the laws of physics as if they are God. And it's problematic because, you know, Newton deciphers the laws of physics and becomes the sage of the age for interpreting physics. And then the problem is that it doesn't quite work out. And then you need a new sage like Einstein to come along and reinterpret Newton. And, and uh, you know, you never quite, you want to say that now we have it, we have utterly figured out the laws. Therefore, we know the mind of God. And, and then, therefore kind of hidden in it is we're kind of supreme because we know the laws right we're kind of like we worship the laws and we, we could work the laws therefore all power to us we've kind of defeated god and that's that's the progressive narrative that's the the, the, the hidden agenda behind the you know enlightenment humanism but uh the, so what's the answer that the sage gives it's simple it's like the Atman and the law are the same thing. That's the answer. So you see that going back to Wu, you, you say, like, no, you, you've gone off track. If, if you could unlock real powers that would allow you to raise the Pentagon and say, no, you can't. That would be a violation of physics. So the, Wu is there, <laughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't. So then you're saying, oh, does it have to conform to Newton's laws? I say, no, those are all bullshit. See, you see, we're imposing all the second order law on the law. So like it, what Newton said is an interpretation, but it's all Newton. What Einstein said is an interpretation, but it's all Newton. Same with Darwin. But here we're saying like, no, they unlocked these immutable uh, your laws that are, you know, this idealistic idea that there's somehow these hidden um, platonic solids and these, you know, all this kind of platonic ideal and somewhere it exists in the metaverse when we unlocking it, these great truths. And you say, no, you're just doing Einstein's interpretation of it and stuff. You're not getting anywhere. And so he's saying like what, what Einstein said and Darwin said and Newton said is bullshit. See, but... That doesn't mean that there isn't nature's law. There's natural law. It's just it's not accessible to you. Well, it, it can be, but you 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 see, we're all just a part, right? So to actually access natural law, you have to be part of the whole. And you can't be part of the whole. It's a contradiction. The whole's are either the whole or the part. But we we're doomed to be a part. And so we can only get to Einstein's interpretation. Every, you can just get a keyhole glimpse of the whole. And so is there somewhere out there the whole that knows itself? No. The whole only knows itself through these multiple keyholes. We're all one of them. So God only knows God through the part. And we're one of those parts. So it's like... But I, I hope you get the fact that I can go through a lot of woo stuff um, and all the ufology and stuff and tease it apart and 
beginning to think it might be necessary because I uncorked a lot of pe people have been writing me things and stuff, and there seems to be a lot of pressure that, that people have been under, and they seem to have this relief that some, somebody is talking sense about woo and not going off the rails in one way or another. And so it seems to me like it might be worth looking at it at the risk that <clears throat> you go too far down the rabbit hole. But um, it's, it seems to me worthwhile exercise to in a few of these things to just to just go through them uh, with with the understanding that we're not discovering the secrets and laws of the universe or getting a glimpse of God or anything. I'm just giving you these things so that when shit gets weird, <laughs> you're going to know how to interpret weird. <laughs> So it really is, um, you know, the, the desiderata extinctionati guide to the universe, I guess. Yeah, there's you a know, lot it's... in the desiderata because if if you just nobody will read it, but if you just read it and and uh, see the questions that distill out of it, 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 it. I mean, the only merit of the the manifesto is it has the merit of the mirror, and so it's just. Put, if, if it can reflect your own thinking, um, it's kind of like total and apocalyptic and stuff. So it's it's confrontational to your own thinking. But if you work through any aspect of it, work through the science or work through the psychology or work through the rationality of the, the approach, any of those, the, the mirror is working on your own psyche and then your psyche is aligning. Probably aligning with me. So you've got to be careful because I was not guaranteed my, my psyche line in the right way. All I can tell you is the world according to you. And like whether that gets you through or not, uh, the results may vary. But the, you see, uh, you, you have to, you know, you is only a, a signpost on the path, right? So you can only go so far with everything I tell you. At some point, you have to break away from Hugh and say like, okay, I, you know, I, I, can, I can get you into the ballpark, but like to actually make it through, you've got to hit the bullseye, smack on. And so it's like, I, you know, at some point it gets, the game gets too fine for you to play with me. You have to play it with yourself. So in other words, you, I can tell, I can be a bit of a guru for you on the, on the road in. But, but you know, I can, it's at some point you have to fight the battle for yourself, and and you know once you get to the really finer points, um, then then you have to, you know, whether you make it or not depends on <laughs> on on you. You're in the ring. I don't, I can coach you on how to approach it, but um, you know, it, you see, a lot of people think the guru is going to fight the fight for them. <laughs> it's like no, <laughs> some at some point you're going to be in the ring alone. Yeah, that's what you learn in, in martial arts. Um, and even when you've been for a while in a dojo and you've been you've been coached and you've been you've been nearly like a little cult really, um, with all the dojo's a cult, a dojo's a cult. It's nice. uh, but at the end of the day when you're in a fight, it's you. It's you. You and not you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's you. <laughs> but then uh yeah, but these things all converge. You see, everybody thinks in terms of of separation and parts and all these distinctions. So if you go to university, there are all these faculties and all these different branches of knowledge and stuff. It's, it's all imaginary. There's no such thing. It's like nature. Nature laughs. If you if you think, oh well, there's you know there's biology and you know, people make apologies. It's like, well, I'm not a physicist, but blah 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 blah. It's like there's no such thing as physics and biology and the humanities and stuff, it's like, it's, it's just bullshit. It's just utter bullshit. The, the minute you make those separations, you're doomed. But, you know, they used to call it a university because it was universal. Now they should call universities partialities or principalities more like, because they're all these little principles, you know, prince and princesses doing these principled things in their principalities. And so, so it's all, you know, all different domains and stuff. And it's like, you're never going to get there if you think in terms of domains, because for starters, you're, 
you'll spend your, your whole life in one domain and you'll be a, an expert of nothing. So it's like all these pictures and then more and more of that less and less. They're getting stupider and stupider. You can see people, look at, look at the universities now. People are getting stupider and stupider and stupider. Why? Because their depth of knowledge is getting narrower and narrower and deeper and deeper. So they're learning more and more about less and less. So it's like, you're never going to get anywhere because the clock's going to run out on you. We say like, you're going you're gonna to turn to the intellectual fight of the ages that's going to demand everything. Your, your bodily strength, your mental strength, your ethical strength, every kind of thing, you, every aspect that you can divide, pretend to divide the human being into, it's going to demand all of those. And then most people are going to go, well, I have a doctorate in civil disobedience. Is that going to help? It's like, not a lot. <laughs> I, I think Voldemort's going to get around that somehow. <laughs> it's like, I have this one pen knife. Or something. It's like, yeah, not a good plan. Um, it's as though, um, <clears throat> you know, in a certain sense, the uh, advancement of uh, science and a lot of other pursuits has taken us backwards because uh, there was a time when a lot of inquiring people were polymaths and, um, you know, that, that's gone. Uh, um, and, you know, so we've become very, very clever in certain narrow ways and very, very stupid in, in more generally useful ways, I guess is what you're saying. Um, yeah, but more than that, there's there's a taboo against being a generalist now. You see, because of yeah, our conception yeah. of knowledge, because we have this idea <clears throat> that not it's a false idea that knowledge is accumulative. So they assume that because you're filling the Bodleian Library with all these tomes, that somehow we're accumulating knowledge. No, because those tomes are not accessible. I mean, already Shakespeare is being completely misinterpreted out of coherence. So. Uh, you know, this idea that we're accumulating this body of knowledge and they talk about the literature and stuff like it's actually, it's, it's a nonsense idea. But it leads people to say that, well, you can't be a generalist. To actually know any one field takes a lifetime. So therefore, anybody that says they know everything about everything is an idiot. Just and That's very entrenched in all the thinking of all these idiots. And you say, well, you know, how do you, <clears throat> you know, because, and it comes from this idea that knowledge is kind of like a fluid and you're filling up this tank. So then you get all these analogies like, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> you know, it's like, okay, not like a tank, but it's like a tree. So we have this tree of knowledge and then, you know, all the work in science is going on in all these branches that, you know, the active tips, the growth points or the leaves. And so science is expanding because the tree is getting bigger and there are more and more growth points and stuff. So, no, dipshit. The understanding, um, the leaf cannot understand anything. The leaf is never going to understand anything. The leaf is just going to grow more and more and consume more and more shit. Basically, for the leaf cannot understand the, the tree in the forest. So it's, it's, it's all about understanding the forest, seeing the wood for the trees. People can't see the wood for the trees and see the forest for the tree or the, wood, the trunk for the branches. Basically, that's what's necessary to figure out what's going on. So, uh, but everywhere they think, you know, the tree of knowledge is expanding and each one of the leaves is growing more long. So one day, human humanity as a whole will have this <clears throat> awesome, all-encompassing knowledge. And say, no, they won't. So like, because why? Because everybody's atomized. You have, it's equivalent of saying, one day, if we, if all the little ants work hard enough, we'll understand the, the superorganism of the ant hive. Say no, you won't. How how is that? How is the superorganism of the of the ant <clears throat> How is the operational parameters of the beehive or the ant colony going to be going to be made available to you if everybody has the brain of an ant? So so all these PhDs and stuff they're getting closer and closer to the brain of an ant, and they but they all share this illusion that they like well no but. Think of it in terms of the ant colony. Say, well, what do you know about the ant colony? You can talk to any PhD or something. And it's like, it's like, well, I'm a soldier ant. And it's like, well, what do you know about what goes on in the, you know, in the queen's uh, chambers? 
Well, it's very interesting. That, it's very interesting to listen to you and Gary often referring to Shakespeare, because <clears throat> I grew up in France and I Shakespeare only came late into my uh, education, and so I, I discovered him well, at a later age. But we had in school a very fundamental teacher um, in uh, in writing, which was Montaigne, and Montaigne wrote the essays, and he was uh, he was more or less talking a lot like you, Hugh. And I remember, and I just found again a quote of him saying, I prefer the company of peasants because they have not been educated sufficiently to reason incorrectly. <laughs> and it was all this, yeah, I don't know if yeah. you, but this uh, this thinker, this writer, Montaigne, was, was permeated my whole secondary school teaching and, and thinking. And I, I find so many, and actually he's a contemporary of, of Shakespeare. Um, it, it, they lived at the same time. Um, yeah, so, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I don't know if you, both of you um, have ever read the essays of Montaigne, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. No, I haven't, but you see, that was... Again, a specialization, you know, he talks about that. He talks about what you're talking about now. But you see, the, well, it, it's good you mentioned, I haven't read that, but the, it's good you mentioned that, because the whole time that Elizabethan era was uh, was uh, you know precursor to the Enlightenment, but it was a great fl flipping in itself. And what caused it was the you know, Black Death. The, the forerunner to it is in thirteen blah, blah, blah. but the the Peasant Revolt in thirteen forty one, I think. And so all of those are precursors, and they came um, from. A physical, very, very physical outcome. If, if you talk to these intellectuals, they, they'll talk about the development of intellectual thought, going from Aristotle and the ancient world, and then moves to the Middle East, and then it's preserved in the monasteries in Ireland during the, the what we use in, in my school used to call the Dark Ages. I'm not allowed to call them the Dark Ages anymore. But anyway, there's this progressive idea that you have this linear line again, this accumulation of knowledge and stuff. And it's like, no, it's not really like that. You see, what it's first of all, it's very physical. You got to look at all the things about you. You have to look at the crops and the weather, and you know, it was caused by famine. <laughs> so basically, what, what Shakespeare. If you talk to somebody that's uh, say a literary analysis or something, somebody that does humanities they will tell you all nonsense about the origins of shakespeare it's like from the cult i was in shakespeare comes from herman hermes trimagistus and the secret knowledge that they don't know about they don't know about the neoplatonists and Marsilio ficino and stuff which my cult took a direct line from so it's an underground history it was underground for a reason is all the guys in universities and stuff, they're clerics, they work for the Catholic Church and they do all these things heresy. So they, first of all, they, had, they don't understand the origins of Shakespeare and they would say, I'm talking nonsense because that was deliberately concealed, that the real Shakespeare was concealed. All the point, all the way down to even the identity of Shakespeare that he was some guy in Stratford. No, he's, he's the sixth Earl of Oxford. <laughs> it's, it's Edward de Vere is, is Shakespeare. So it's, it's like, so straight away, you know, the guys are off track by a million miles. But you say, what Shakespeare's works is basically, they came intrinsically out of, the, you know, the, um, the medieval cold period and the, you know, the, the um, they came out of climate change and about uh, out of pandemic. So, you know, already we, we're in those times. We're in those times you can see. That, you know, it's well worth going back to those times and seeing them. They, they're going through to a psychological flipping. So that's, it's not a linear progression. It's, it's more like, you know, the, um, like Stephen Jay Gould's, uh, you know, got so panned for saying, you know, there's punctuated evolution. Mm -hmm. But it... It is. It's a chaotic system, and it's it's unstable. So the, the people think, yeah, okay, but yeah, they all kind of separate. You have a different line of socioeconomics, and then that's completely different to you know geophysical realities or something like this. No, is that they're all inseparable. So you can't study them in isolation. You you, you turn yourself into a moron. But the the, <coughs> the um, 
you know, the, but then you see people think, yeah, but they must be separate somehow. It's, it's like, okay, the, if you look at the manifesto, you're saying, okay, I'm saying the, the Greenland ice sheet is melting. There's the physics. You look at the physics that just run the freaking math, put it in a supercomputer. You can put it on a laptop these days and you can see the earth is going to flip. Now you say, okay, but then that is a geophysical event. Now, why are you talking about woo and the psychology and stuff like that? Saying like, no, they filled your head with concrete. In your world, you think the Earth, uh, you know, is the Earth flip is entirely separate to human psychology and what goes on. You see, if if you go back to all the legends of Atlantis, they say stuff like that was the hubris of the people that the people got all this hubris hubris that you can see in big dollops right today and they'd say that basically they became immoral and you can see all of that today now we say all oh, those were guys were superstitious idiots and say like they didn't understand that there was a natural catastrophe like a volcano and, and then you know and the sinking of Atlantis, and it's, it's metaphor and all this, you know, confabulations to try and explain it away. But what people cannot get to is this idea that, no, human psychology is not on a different track to the Earth system and the geology and stuff. That's your fantasy, <laughs> not compartmentalized. So you've got to get into the syncretist idea that the flippening is metaphor and reality. It's physical. They all go mesh into each other. It's Kairos meets Kronos. They don't. You, you can't put Kairos in a box and say, well, you know, it's uh, this this big flippening event where the poles reverse. And, but, you know, the human psychology of a, of a psych psychological transformation is disconnected. <laughs> the one's creating the other. Think of it that way. So in other words, but now don't get too woo. You know, you might say, well, can we flip the, the earth with our thoughts? You say, well, that's ego talking. That's Timothy Leary going to the, the Pentagon and saying, can we flip the Pentagon? Can we just sit on the lawn? All the hippies get together. We just project our thoughts onto the, onto the Pentagon and flip it over and say, no, you can't. I say, why? Say, it's not physics. So like, show, show me where, where you got all the energy to do this. You say like, you know, barrels of oil, bushels of wheat. I want to see Wheaties, calories that came out of your breakfast. So there's enough to, to this. Basically, and you say, oh, okay, I can, you can get that. So it's like we could use our minds to flip the, the Pentagon and say, yeah, but not in 1968. It's like the psychology was not there. There are too many impediments in your head. It's like you know, some people believe in woo. There are an equal number of people that don't believe in woo, and they like the cough that are stopping the bits that are trying to do woo. But so it's like everything is self-neutralizing. It's not the time. And you say, like, when do you get to the time? Well, it's hard to say, but, <laughs> but like, they all converge, right? They all converge in this physical point where everything makes sense. That like, saying, oh, now I have the, the wisdom, I have the ability, I have the cities, uh, I have the energy, everything comes. The physics works, the, everything comes, uh, and then we have launch. Uh, you're saying that now, at this particular time, that there's a conversion, uh, and therefore, for instance, you've got the energy capacity to uh, form uh, matter in the form of these uh, UFOs. Uh, I mean, are you coming down to being that literal about it? Or? Yeah, but, okay, but then my personal view is that there are no I see somebody sent me this thing the, my personal view is there are no aliens out there so get get rid of the idea that we're being visited we no no I'm, I'm, what I'm referring to is your your you were saying that the, these people are literally manifesting these physical objects uh, and and what I'm saying is yeah well, of physics, right? so, so no 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 but that, that's the point I'm making so obviously they're getting together somehow a very large amount of energy to create yes, some now mass. you're onto the right track you see you yeah. see think about it if if you make a claim and I I will not dispute the claim that that um they have alien spacecraft in secret bases and stuff and they reverse engineering them. 
So it's saying like, um, now there, those spacecraft, my argument is a manifestation of their own woo. It's their own mind. Yeah. But you see, they didn't get that. That, you see, think how much energy. If you get a bit of yeah. exotic material and stuff and say, okay, look, how much energy it puts to process there. You, it's basically, I can show you there's like, there's long range order. And so you say you have layers of bismuth and exotic materials at high purity. I say like, okay, go mm -hmm. through it. You just take a conventional smelting process that gets you that level of purity. And it's like, there's a lot of energy in all of those things. So you're saying like, did they get all of this just spontaneously Wolf Harry Potter style Abracadabra. Is it no? That energy literally came from someone. So there's a lot of energy. You can only get to it at this time. When you have a, an egregore, see, again, if you, if you grant me a little extension of woo here, if you have nuclear energy, if you have all these powers and stuff, they, these are actually sources of energy that also fuel woo, right? So by the time you get to the 1950s, you have an energy budget where you can actually manifest a bit of metal. Like this. It's hard to see where this would happen to hunter-gatherers and stuff. You see, in hunter-gatherers, <clears throat> you can see like at Gebekli Tepe. No, nobody uncovered a spaceship in the, you know, a flying saucer in the middle of Gebekli Tepe. I mean, it's amazing shit that they're doing. They were busy carving all these megaliths uh, without stone tools and stuff. This is, they well into Wu. You can see they, they're using Wu. There's no, there's no way you can raise these things to the, you know, all these Graham Hancock and these guys, they say like, look, this is Wu. He's, he's right. But you see, they haven't got, they only got the, and they're feasting like buggery. Just like a saying like in the, in the schoolhouses in my cult. You can see the evidence of the energy. They're eating meat like there's no tomorrow, right? They're drinking beer, having alcohol. These are fuels. <laughs> you need that physical fuel to get the woo to carve all the stones. Right? So it's like the, you know, the, uh, uh, you, it's only, so you're not going to find a spaceship in, in the middle of Gebekli Tepe. You're not going to unearth it. But why? They just don't have the energy to to manifest that amount of woo to have a physical <laughs> object. And, and also the, the knowledge, they don't have the spells and stuff. So it's like, we kind of only in the 1950s get to the point where we have um, the energy available. And again, it's, it's exactly like the forbidden planet. If you go to the forbidden planet, it's kind of saying what I just said. I, we're I, moving I, towards the forbidden planet. The, the forbidden planet is, is a metaphor for the flipping. But you can see that they say that what is the source of energy of all of this stuff? And it's like you're moving, you need that energy to move into the, the straight under the laws of physics uh, to move it, into the forbidden zone. It, it, it's getting a little bit late in the meeting to ask some questions I'd like to ask on this. And I was wondering, maybe we could expand on, on this in the Western meeting this afternoon, because I, I don't get it completely, all this thing with energy and manifestation. And I, I would really need to ask some questions. But yeah, we're nearly three hours into this meeting. Okay, and well, I don't think okay, we can... well let's, let's, ra let's round this one off. But it's okay. So I want to introduce there this concept that we don't have. And we kind of filed it up. Um, but it's uh, just a simple advance deposit. And it is, uh, there's clearly something to do with like a concept, a unified concept, just like we have like space time. We're missing this concept of information energy. So all our ideas of information and energy have been screwed up by a long series of idiots like Shannon and <laughs> Wiener and Feynman and Einstein and all of these people have done a great job of screwing up our understanding. But so the but if you hold on to the concept of information energy, it's it's not just an energy. It's kind of like the knowledge. Or so so you. You need you need the spell and you need the energy, <laughs> it's like, and so yeah, and that also ties in with spells. I can come back, I can use that as an intro into how spells work as well. Yeah. All right. Well then, okay. Let's have an energy energy break. Energy break. But so so one of the things that basically you're doing with the exercise is. Um,
is just stopping the hemorrhaging of energy. So one of the ways you, you can get to Wu, and, and that is you have to accumulate energy in a centralized spot. So if you want to, if you're Timothy Leary and you want to, like, you know, levitate the Pentagon, you, you, um, first of all, you have to aggregate all that amount of energy in one place. Now, hippies are tremendously good at one thing, and that's dissipating energy. <laughs> it's like, it's one thing that hippies are good at is lack of focus, dissipating energy all over the shop. It's always cats, herding cats. So the, the very first prerequisite that it, that he would have had to done, it, it, you know, Timothy Leary would have heard all the cats into one place and build up all the energy. That would have been step one, which he, he didn't know. But, it, but so how that energy is built up is, is, is not sucked out of the universe. It's just to stop the hemorrhaging. So we have all this energy inside us. Again, it sounds like a hack motivational speaker, but we really do. It's just we hemorrhaging, dissipating, we can't focus it. Right? So it's just bleeding out energy. One of the ways to gather it in and stop this massive hemorrhaging of energy that's just, you know, like a television is not beaming shit to you. It's sucking energy yeah. out of you. Yeah. And so the, and, and then look at 5G. You want to know what's dangerous about 5G? It's asymmetry between the transmission and the reception. So it's like, you know, is, look at the internet. The, the upload speeds were tiny and the download speeds were huge. Because they see they they're giving you a deluge of information and just taking a little trickle up from you, but like in five G that changes now the massive amounts of energy are going up into the web and they're just in effect giving you a hundred you know well a gig or something coming down, so so that basically stops uh, that means they're sucking energy they're taking energy information and sucking so imagine 5g and the new brave world that it's just sucking like uh, like the matrix sucking energy out of your, out of your little head is basically that's that's what's that's what's dangerous about 5g this is basically the, the information going out is a vast pipe and they're just giving you a little drip feed to keep you alive so it's kind of like feeding a plant with a little bit of nutrients and then taking all the fruit. And that's, that's the explanation. <laughs> why, why do you do this? But you can only understand that if I explain to you about uh, information and so, yeah, an energy information concept of a unified energy information. But, uh, but again, we're getting a bit woo. And, uh, but anyway, the, the exercise, the exercise we do now, the pause is to stop hemorrhaging and, energy and so this this is the way you do it first of all is is just close your eyes so that you know basically you're not investing in huge amounts of energy in what you're looking at and then take a deep breath so you're not investing physical energy and muscular energy into tension and all these uh, self-defeating Actions are working against each other. Get in touch with your senses. So it's kind of like a withdrawing or pulling back in to the center. So feel that kind of gathering up. Feel the sounds coming into you. Don't bleed out into the sounds or the things around you. Gather up your attention and just focus behind your eyes. Could focus your attention anywhere, but behind your eyes is an easy one. Anyway, the the reason why the reason why uh, the subject of woo and stuff makes me very very tired is because I'm giving up a lot of information energy to to you, and I hope it's to your benefit. Please don't squander it. <laughs> but uh, literally, it comes out of the food I eat. You know, but you... 
Well, thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you very um, much. I hope you won't be too drained for the Western meeting this afternoon. No, it's a small price to pay to mm -hmm. bleed a bit of energy for this, but yeah, but, but yeah, that's the meditation is also to try and stop the, the hemorrhaging. <laughs> stop the hemorrhaging. <laughs> Hugh, do you think the uh, constant flow of uh, posts on Reddit seem to be uh, a drain holes into which people's energy gets lost. Yeah, it, it, it is, but you see, it's up to me. I, I mean, I have to regulate how much energy I've got to put into it. So, so No, you know, I mean, from the point of view of people looking at them all the time, they're relentlessly negative. Um, you know, they, they do suck your energy out. Oh no, that's not sex energy. It's yeah, you know that those guys are just doing a blocking action. They're just trying not to do their therapy, and so it's just the alien cortex doing protecting itself. It's like that's that's pretty low energy for me. I mean, it's, it's pretty <laughs> pretty trivial. Um, oh, what, what what really drains my energy is the genuine things that people come with genuine questions, and then uh, you know to to actually answer them and stuff and i can feel this it's like a death eater but that that is a real transfer of my information energy to them but you know for most i think that's what part, um, there's no transfer of energy these people are just being idiots yeah no it, no what i mean it's more a low grade form of energy it's it's just their anxiety and and their yeah. shitty headedness and stuff so it's like it's, it's it's trivial amounts of energy compared to actually you know transferring a large bit of energy. Yeah. So, in other words, just to give you a, a, a glimpse into, say, the concept of a unified energy information is like, think of the energy information that went into the tempest. It's it's very much like uh, Rothko. You see, people people are confused about the physical and and the information energy part. For so, for example, like Rothko uh, was in his studio. Um, having an exhibition, like an artist is giving you a lot of psychic information energy, right? not always very focused or directed. They don't know what they're doing. They're just kind of channeling it. So <clears throat> but <clears throat> Rothko said, so you've got a little shithead, you know, kind of Michael Shermer, the critic, the cop, um, who's there in the studio and, uh, you know, very skeptical looking at all these, these paintings that that Rothko gets millions for, literally like four million for this canvas that is, just looks like what you what you see when you look through your eyes here with this, the phosphine. So in other words, he does a painting of kind of phosphines behind his eyes, kind of squared up. And the little shithead goes and says, um, says, how long does it take you to paint a picture like this? What he's doing is saying, look, Arsel, you took 15 minutes to paint this. You're just screwing with everyone in the whole of the art scene. They're paying extraordinary amounts of money, and you're just knocking these things off in 15 minutes. That's, that's, what, that's the, in essence, the accusation. But Rothko, what he said was really gives you an insight into, like, information and energy. So the guy said, you know, how long does it really take you? So, well, Rothko was about 54, I think, at the time. And he said, it takes 54 years to do a picture like this. And he's right. It's not a clever witticism. It's like really, really, he's, he's giving you some information there that's a gem. Do you, do you uh, see it also most as being... Read that in the UK, so, ho, 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 he put him in his place. But as, as think about it. Think about it. If, if 54 years of all... Rothko's thought and everything were distilled into one picture and given a due. Yeah. Imagine what went into the tempest. <laughs> it's like, wow, there's more than a storm in a teacup there. Um, yeah. Is there any sense in which you would see it? Is there any sense in which you would see it as also a portal for energy for people who are, yes. you know, well, you, well you get it out. You win, yeah. you win this session, Gary, with that final. <laughs> Touche at the end is like you win. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. 
I remember the well, dream. The no, dream. I, I actually thought I thought he would shoot me down by saying, oh, no, you can't just pull this energy out of the universe and get it for free. It's once only, you know. No, you, I, I'm not I shooting can't, you down I can't. on that one. I'm shooting you up on that one. <laughs> mm. Remember that last yeah. word. <laughs> but I, I do remember the draining when I used to work for years as a doctor. Not and, and I think the draining was not the physical <laughs> presence or the, the delivering of, of physical treatments. It was the information that you had to impart to people to try to explain to them what they had and how to help them. And I, I remember completely like a pancake going home, like nothing, nothing left. Yeah, because you just but, but as, a, as, a, as a doctor, you're a shaman. And so they, they're sucking energy out of you. They're coming to you to suck you know, mm. as like vampires sucking in. To, to actually tell somebody, you know, like, uh, actually, you what you've got is terminal and blah, blah, blah and stuff. The psychic energy in giving somebody a terminal diagnosis and stuff, it, it just like chops five years off the end of your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the funny thing about working in the countryside is that a lot of people used to come with food for you. <laughs> They'd bring you fish and eggs and... And things and it, now that you no, talk about this energy, I'm thinking, wow, no, but, but it, it was a symbol but there. You see how wise this is? They're running their own Gebekli Tepe, right? Yeah. So the, this is what everybody would have done in Gebekli Tepe. They bring a sacrifice and yeah. they, they bring all this food because they know that they're taking food out. It's like they know very well. They're, they're better <laughs> physicists than any any physicist alive today. So, um, but they, but yeah, you're running young to go back to Tepe, they're bringing food to, to <laughs> feed the flames and stuff. And then now all these idiots go and say, oh, well, ma they're making animal sacrifices. Weren't they stupid? Mm. And say, no, you're stupid. Because <laughs> you've lost how to get a sacrificial sheep and transfer it into energy information. Okay. So we'll go through the portal um, this afternoon at uh, 5.30 and I, I stop recording now. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Sophie, thanks, Hugh. Bye then.